let's say that I'm with a black woman and she says to me, call me the N word. I've yeah. got to sit down and go, well, let's just talk about why you might want that. No, or do I go, no, okay, let's that. try it out and see what happens. It's, it's not, it's not, like, yeah, go on around. I mean, it is for me at least the other way around is far more worrying. It's entirely possible that this thing only exists and expresses itself in that one aspect of consensual sexual interaction, in which case isn't really a big issue with it. But the issue is if you have like one of those beliefs, it is unlikely that's going to only express itself in like one domain in your life. Like a lot of girls like, I just want really emotionally available men. And then they date yep. nasty the men <laughs> over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then when emotionally available men, not just like creepy nice guys, but like actually really like solid, solid healthy men come along, they're like, eh. Not my cup of tea, right? And so it's like, if you meet somebody and they're like picking their nose, a lot of people are gonna be, eh, whatever. You know, that's kind of weird. But like, if somebody, your partner of three years, picks their nose, it's not like you're gonna go pack your bags, you know? Height does hurt people as a standard, but it's never hurt people nearly as much as the weight standard has. And the doctor, who's a bit of a kinkster, says, well, do you mind if I fuck your dead body? And the guy says, yes, that's fine. And then they get fucking euthanized and the doctor hops on him and fucks him. Is that okay or not? I think that the, the, the reason- That's a good question. This is not <laughs> yeah, an answer. Okay. I think when, you, when you The answer is like... arrest him, execute well, him. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The Wait, hold on. <laughs> so, like, why couldn't I say, like, me as a uh, Giga Chad meat eater, uh, can fuck horses. No. You can, but like shit testing is just basically saying, I don't trust you and I don't even mm. trust you enough to just communicate my boundaries or concerns. So instead I'm going mm -hmm. to trick you. Like it's just so manipulative. I want to address the elephant in the room because you guys were talking Game about like, fucking celebrities and shit. Well, like what if your job's a niche internet micro celebrity? True. Um, there's some evidence that incest may be somewhat like the disgust and revulsion we feel for it specifically, maybe somewhat like genetically inborn. Trying to do something. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you for coming. This is going to be, a, I came with like a sort of a, a placeholder name. I'm just going to call it Saturday Social. We're going to talk about sex and dating. Uh, we got some like kind of interesting questions, but I'm not going to be like a huge stickler on it. But obviously we're going to try to like walk the TOS lines, but also still like <laughs> banter and chirp each other because this shit should get interesting. Don't be afraid to levy or uh, level out some punches. Uh, don't Wait, good question. Wait, wait, wait. I'm, only, I'm only here yeah. to flirt with Joe, just to be clear. <laughs> That's literally the exclusive reason that I'm here, so... Hey, I wasn't so aware clear. this is about sex. Do we have to have had sex to talk about sex? No. no. Well, you're here, so we're good. <laughs> okay, yeah. that's good. I got lots of takes, lots of incel takes for you. Perfect. Excellent. Amazing. Alright, yeah, why don't you guys... Uh, I'm gonna go uh, from... Joe to Relly to Chud, Loner, Erudite, and the Rosers. Literally just like going through one through one as I try to get Lydia. Why don't you guys just like do like the intro, short intro, just say hi, whatever. And um, then I'll find Lydia. Cool. Okay, well, I'll start. Hi, I'm Joe. Um, I, I stream intermittently, but when I do, I tend to talk about this shit. I'm super interested in like sexual ethics, how to have incredible sex, how to have meaningful relationships. I'm interested in also like the real loss of that in today's society in terms of like community relationships, like the, the epidemic of loneliness and just like also how politics sort of affects desire and what that means. Um, but yeah, I'm just, let's fuck around and find out tonight. Or today, for you guys. Awesome. Uh, really? All right. Can y'all hear me well? Is it bad yeah, or good? Yeah, you sound great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. So, uh, yeah, my name is Irrelevant. Uh, I like talking about uh, sex and dating. The reason why I'm on here is because I've been looking into primarily the black pill community and the red pill community for quite a bit of time. But uh, the reason why I've been interested in them is mainly because I think they're pretty funny with some of the shit they say. And so uh, it, it also presents a problem where I have to be responsible while looking at it. So I uh, try to get at least somewhat educated on sex and dating, given my very limited history, because I don't value it too much in my personal life. And so, yeah, I'm just glad to be here. And maybe I can give a little bit of a black-pilled approach, or I guess a... Uh, approach that is maybe more akin to what I think the black bill is and talk about how it's the bad things about it, the good things about it and stuff like that. Cause I think it has some ideas that unfortunately are 
true. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's excellent. We have some uh, diversity of, uh, uh, of ideas here. Uh, awesome. Chud. Okay, I'm Chud Logic. I'm here to represent my people, and that's <laughs> men that are too ugly and stupid to get laid. So that's going to be my, uh, my thought process on this. Uh, I'm going to bring the memes. Hopefully there's some soy that we can talk about. I always enjoy talking about a bit of soy. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to having a chat and seeing what everyone's perspectives are. Excellent. Yeah, you know, I think that's correct for the Twitch audience, right? There's yeah, exactly. a lot of sex havers, but even more not sex havers. True. Have notters. All right, uh, Loner, the guy that is here but not here. Hi, uh, I'm Lonerbox. I'm a YouTuber, and I like short intros. Based. Excellent. Uh, Erudite? Uh, yeah, I'm Erudite. I have no idea what perspective I will be representing within this. Probably shape as I hear kind of what people are talking about. Sweet. And last but not least, the Svenska. Exactly. Uh, yeah, my name is Rosebrist. I'm a streamer and YouTuber. And I think probably the most unique perspective I'm going to be bringing to this is that I think I'm a fair bit younger than a lot of people here. I'm 18. I'm currently still a student, so I can bring that perspective as well to this discussion. And yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I tried to actually get like a kind of a range of ages as well as people that I thought would like banter well and like feed off each other and shit. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for the intros. Uh, if you're in my chat, anybody else's chat, whatever, you can type guests. Uh, not everybody else. If you're in my chat, you can type in guests to see like who everybody else is. But um, yeah, let's just dive right into it. Um, so I thought we'd talk about sex and dating because it seems like this is a really, really common like subsection of Twitch as a whole. You have that cute bot streamer and there's like a bunch of like derivative streamers. There are other streamers that have done it before that cute bot girl where they do like dating viewers like speed dating, like what the fuck ever. So clearly, like dating, even though we all love like blood sports, gaming, like all this shit, clearly people love sex. We all know that. And they love socializing, dating, etc. So uh yeah, let's uh let's get right into it. Um I will pose the question and then um I'm not gonna try to go like one by one, but so if somebody has something like they're like burning to talk about, just like raise your hand or even just interject there's only a couple of people so um let me get right into the question uh the first question is chasing immutable characteristics such as ethnicity like something such as yellow fever um or being british because there's a lot of american women that really prioritize like british accent can you just tell me what's the oh, i've forgotten what's the one where you like black people what's that one can you just tell me <laughs> 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 I think was that like a snow bunny, like uh, fuck, be, I forget. No, so it's the That's tropics. a Canadian. Anyway, oh, it doesn't matter. Okay, it's, it's a snow something, but yeah. Anyway, it's, it's no wait, isn't good. it snow for like if you really if you're looking for like white women, snow bunny, right? It's jungle yeah, fever. Yeah. Okay, oh. let's go to the chase. Okay, okay, oh. jungle fever. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, but yeah, the British or like other characteristics or like like their profession, like uh, like a streamer, right? Like let's say, uh, nobody was a streamer. Oh, sorry, it's, let's say. Let's say Joe was the viewer, and let's say Erudite was the streamer, right? So maybe Joe was really into Erudite because she was a streamer, right? So that's chasing the particular characteristic. Um, so it's not just immutable characteristic. It's something, anything about the person that is um, not the... But I mean, that's complicated, stuff. Bryce, right? Because mm -hmm. that, like, when I was reading the question, I was like, there's a huge difference between liking someone because you love black men and liking someone because they're a streamer like a huge difference absolutely there is but in the kind of like the abstract of it right there's still like when you abstract everything you remove the nuance from it there's still that kind of ballpark that everything that's all in right you're not liking but then the, the question becomes the, the question becomes but but that is part of the individual surely we are all made up of individual components of who we are our occupation our culture our families what we care about so if you make it too abstract, it becomes like, is it okay to like people? 
So yeah. I think there there is importance to define between like actual immutable characteristics which have political histories and are socially constructed components as well as like uh, as well as being a phenotype and saying oh what if you what if you like someone because they're famous what if you like someone because they're hot like there is a difference. Yeah, we could we could like I think one way to divide this would just be like okay characteristics that you can't really change about yourself and then characteristics that you can like for example your profession would fall into the latter and like your ethnicity would fall into the former and that way we can keep it about being like, fat because that's yeah. a difficult one isn't it people say you can change yeah, it it's not that really was easy. tough that was tough being fat is tough I mean so is disability like lots of great sex work comes out of disability and uh, like a uh, work on <laughs> work on sex. What, you mean it's in people in a wheelchair getting a hand job? Is that what you mean? Yeah, because the issue is, right, if you're like, wow, that person is being fetishized because they've got a disability, then you're actually taking away from them any ability to have sexual desire as well. Like suddenly this person, their condition means they're no longer a sexual subject because anytime someone wants to fuck them or give them a hand job or help them out, it's like, oh, you're taking advantage of that person who's disabled. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, for me, the question is actually, I've talked about it several times. It's not that hard for me, at least it's just, it depends on why. So for instance, let's talk about, um, let's say I fetishized, uh, Asian people, or I'd probably have to get more specific. Let's say Chinese people. Um, it, let's say I fetishized Chinese people or not fetishized. I specifically wanted to date a Chinese person. If the reason why was just cause Chinese people and that's just it, I would say that's definitely pretty weird. And it's just Chinese. And if I like figured out that actually they took like a 23 in me and it turns out they were from, you know, Japan, I was like, oh no, that's gross now. Like, yeah, that's pretty fucking weird. But if we're talking about like, I like them because they're Chinese and I want to live in an environment where they practice and they do practice the Chinese culture, then I don't see a problem with it. I think it depends on why you like them for whatever reason. I don't, I don't well, think just. I think it also you know, matters about like the limitations, right? Like if you like them only because of like, right? Like fetishizing to me implies like specifically you're almost like hunting or looking for an individual based precisely on certain characteristics and maybe not a lot else. And then we also have to talk about like, okay, well, are we talking about just for sex or for dating, right? Because like the way that you select partners for like a casual hookup might be different than the way that you select partners for somebody who's maybe more long-term. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So like a casual hookup, I'm like, I don't know. I just feel like if you're w wanting like a certain thing, like it is what it is. But if you're like, I only will have a partner from like their this with this very precise immutable characteristic, like they must be a paraplegic. That would be really strange to me. Like, like why? Like, why is that important to you as like a long term partner? Like metric, mm -hmm. like. Sure. That seems like a strange selection. And I think for the changeable ones as well. So for example, let's say for some reason, somebody is absolutely like fucked in the head and they really want to date a streamer for whatever reason. I cannot imagine <laughs> why anyone want to do that. But let's say that that's the case. And then, you, you know, you really like this person, you really fetishize them because they're a streamer or whatever. And then you guys get in a relationship and like two years down the road, you have a new career opportunity and you go in to do something else. And then your partner's just like, yeah, you're not streaming anymore. See ya, you know, like if, if that's the yeah. case, if it's something changeable like that, that's probably something that the person with the strong preference should make clear at the very get-go so it's not like you're you, you get into like a really long thing and then you just leave for something that True. the other person like didn't even realize was a pretty significant thing Based. well i mean i think the, the main reason that people tend to go for certain races because it tends to come down to the racing that's what we're most interested in um is because there's there's a stereotype of certain characteristics that they're going to have right so you know women chase black men um in my opinion, mainly because they believe there's certain characteristics that black men have, which isn't say always it. true. I'm so told. What? No, don't I don't know. Win. I've never heard of this before. You never heard of this before. No. No. I'm actually not racist. Right. So I don't, know what I don't you're think it's a thing in Europe, right. actually. So yeah, you need to enlighten me. Well, basically, the the rumor is, according to you know various sources, is that black men have large penises. Um, I don't know if anyone's heard of this before. But it's it's a very common yeah. trope, and it's actually got its roots in like racist sexualization of black men, right? Um, yeah, men dingle and dingle parties and uh, other things. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, you know, and, and my friends tell me about certain types of pornography, which you know focuses on this particular thing. And um, I think you know, like for example, I remember once I was on um, I can't remember what website it was. It was some weird dating site, and there was this woman who like was specifically looking to get impregnated by a black man, right? 
and like took some sense of some sense of enjoyment out of the fact she was getting impregnated by a black guy. Now, to me, there's some weird race thing happening there that goes beyond just oh yeah, you know, I think that you know I like the appearance of black skin. Say, you know, if there's like a more deep rooted thing there, that probably is somewhat problematic. I would say. Yeah. Well, there's this yeah, weird thing I mean, where a lot of people select partners. Like I've I've heard lots of like precisely white women talk about like how they really want like a mo like a a baby like a mixed baby and it's like yeah. it's a weird it's a mm. weird thing to select partner based on like a ge genetic <laughs> genetic and how else will we get rid of racism? expressions yeah it, maybe they're just trying to like do the lord's work and um yeah. <laughs> this yeah. it's really that's interesting why do the lord's work and what you know get rid of get rid of racism all right a little bit of great replacement okay. <laughs> yeah i mean Just when casual. it comes to like like these like immutable characteristics like chad said i think it has a lot to do with the the reason so for example let's say let's say we're talking about uh, yellow fever and this is something that's it's fundamentally like impossible to really get at the only way you can really like find out like whether the reason is something that we think is okay or not okay would be if the person themselves did a lot of introspection and obviously from an external perspective it's not really possible to do that unless this person drops some like very obvious hints or whatever but just for an example like let's say that you have uh, we're talking about yellow fever then in this example if you just have and like you introspect and you come to terms that this is what it is you just have an aesthetic you know um, um, attraction towards more like Asiatic phenotypes like that's one thing I think that's probably fine I don't think there's an issue with that but if for example like your your yellow fever or your attraction to Asian individuals comes from the fact that you perceive and you believe Asian individuals especially women to be like really like you know submissive and and uh, like uh what's it called like taking care of the home and you kind of ascribe all these personality traits to them and that's how you kind of get it at that then you kind of you're stereotyping in a way that probably isn't very healthy and probably shouldn't be encouraged and then you probably want to introspect on them and be like hey what are the reasons for this really is this really like a reflective or responsible or a healthy way to like form my attraction based on these preferences and then kind of work on that that way do we disagree yeah. with exclusivity being a good tell like you were talking about making it very obvious because one of my and i want to hear from whether you guys think that that's a bad barometer to use i think exclusivity is a good way to describe that like whether or not you're being like too fetishizing with the people that you're trying to date let's say you know the yellow fever stuff if you will only date an asian woman no matter what like you, yeah. you could meet a black woman that's perfect but no she's she's black ha they have to be asian yeah. like i'd say that's when it's like entering the point that's like, eh, okay yeah i mean, right, still, I mean... It's, it, it's like technically possible still that it, it, it's just a preference but oh, it, 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 it like when it comes to like thinking yeah. about the, the the probability the probability is yeah, leaning more and more like, towards it being like a really strange reason and like I, a not okay i wonder reason. why right like if the reason why is they're like well i just i just find asian women really attractive like bar none the most attractive and i think if i was dating anything other than an asian woman i'd be really tempted to date outside of my partner because like i just find them so attractive right that might be like weird but like tolerable whereas if they're just like oh well i just really hate black people like i would never want like a oh, sure. you know a member of this race to be like right so like mm -hmm. i i think it really is going to depend on like why um it, it you know it's a little weird but i i don't know if it's necessarily problematic unless we're the thing is, right, let's be real, people people don't normally go, oh yeah, you know, I, I um, you know, like this or like that. Normally they just exclude a vast swath of people. So it is, I wouldn't date a, a black person or I wouldn't date an Indian person. Um, is something I saw the other day on Twitter, some um, conversation on Grindr about that. So, you know, I think it's about, this is the thing with preferences, they never express as preferences. Normally in the conversations they're expressed as, I would not date this particular group of people. You know, presumably because you think they've got some characteristic that you're not going to find attractive. Or body There's like stacks of research on on Grinder because people are really explicit there. There'll be like no fats, no femmes, no Asians. Like they'll just say it in their profile. Um, but I mean, it goes both ways, right? In terms of like you've got the politics of exclusion. Do people have a right to sex? Like, do people? Do we have? A political obligation to desire everyone are there political obligations on our desire which i think is like trying to give a cat a bath in some instances um and then you've got the other way which is like is it is it weird if someone's sexuality is defined by political structures outside of them like the idea that asian women are going to be submissive or the idea that black men are going to be aggressive tops like is that that's an, a problem as well where you're hypersexualized. so it does have both elements to it it's great that you mentioned the hypersexuality uh, in the aftermath of tweeting out even just the 
uh, I think the was it just the guests and like the the poster which also side note there's no poc erasure just to be clear for whatever reason the guy that designing the poster just left off really i don't know for why. some reason hmm. yeah. <laughs> why me i don't i could like in china where they did the star wars poster and made the black guy smaller that's what that is. <laughs> exactly um yeah no i think i think it's also worth noting that on top of that there is some like schizo poster, like orbiter of I think of Chuds. I'm not sure because he <laughs> tagged Loner and Eridai as well. But it seems like they had an issue with talking about like um, African Americans and hypersexuality. So yeah, but, like let's. I feel like we can dive into that. Like, uh, is it ever okay? Um, but okay, let me phrase a slightly different question um, in the same area as that particular topic. Is it ever okay? to um use those stereotypes or like uh, even if it's not like, like race play yeah exactly thank you well race plays I mean, its own thing kind of like, <laughs> is race play okay is that what you're asking uh, it's more um is like the general is, is there like a, a a property to these things like the um um because joe's talking about like the political structures the social structures uh, a lot of the things that exist outside of like that particular dynamic between the two people that ex you know that are like superstructures around them in their like development um so i'm wondering does it uh like does it have a particular property that gives it like a moral like a moral status a moral value or um like maybe determined by society or like you know just kind of spitballing some ideas for shit to talk about I've... Yeah, so I mean, race plays okay. I don't think anyone would disagree with that, would they? Like, if someone says, "Oh, I want you to call me X in the bedroom and it's private and stuff," what's the problem? No harm. Yeah, yeah it's kind of like I mean, the same I, thing I with the purpose. Really... It depends on the reasons, right? Yeah, it yeah. might be worth like yeah. asking yourself why yeah, exactly. you like that. That's kind of like the big important thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, now wait a second. Why? Okay, so let's say that I'm with a black woman and she says to me, "Call me the N word." I've yeah. got to sit down and go. Well, let's just talk about why you might want that, no, or do I go? No, okay, let's that. try it out and see what happens. It's, it's not. It's not like, yeah, go on, Harold. I mean, at least for me, at least the other way around is far more worrying. Oh yeah, of course. If you got <laughs> yeah, some boyfriends, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll be racist to you to come. Uh, that's the only way. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like I just want to be clear. There's two big differences there. Some white chick says that to me. I'm like. All right, listen, maybe maybe we just, you know, go home in separate cars. But like if if it's uh you know, if it's the the I guess marginalized person for lack of a better term, because this would include, you know, all different categories of people, um, I don't think it's your responsibility to like inquire with them. I would say that they independently should figure out what's up because maybe, maybe it's just totally fine or maybe it's not. I don't know. I think I think r rational people can partake in that it's just you know make sure that it's yeah. just like me myself i'm not going to run the risk or be do any of that the, the problem the, the problem oh, that's what i meant with like kinks that's what so i meant with you like you doing the fetishizing because obviously that example you gave child if, if like the if you're like with a black woman and she wants you to call the n-word yeah it would be weird for you to be like oh have you really explored why you enjoy this like power <laughs> relationship that would be a bit patronizing yeah yeah, I get them. But I, I think that it's probably like, um, yeah, I don't know if it's the on the obligation of the the partner, but yeah, like if if you have like certain sexual desire, I think it's it's just generally like for this is like just a general prescription for like ninety nine percent of all your preferences ever. It's just a good idea to just like introspect and think a little bit about them to be like, hey, like what's the reason for me doing that? Is it like a just like a like a subconscious like racist belief I have that's pushing me towards having these preferences, or might there be something else? And then yeah, through introspection, you can kind of get closer to that. But I'm not sure if I would say it's like the obligation of the partner than in that instance to be like okay well hold on let's draw like a big mind map of where this preference of yours comes from and then we can go through it and like draw the fucking red string between all of them and figure like out your entire sexual like psychology like before we do this thing but i think it's probably a good idea to introspect and i think conversations with your partners about that can be helpful if you're trying to introspect and you involve somebody else in it uh that might like illustrate a few like shortcomings you might have and things you may not realize that other people might pick up on but that's like a good rule of thumb for sex in general, isn't it? Like if you like, yeah, because yeah, you learn things about yourself when you're introspective about what you like and you, especially when you communicate about what you like and maybe why you like it and you can learn more things about yourself. So, yeah, absolutely. yeah.
I mean, I, I would say like, while the introspection is like good and valuable, of like figuring out why you prefer things sometimes, especially when it comes to like sexual preferences and stuff, I think we're going to have a hard time, like putting our finger on precisely why, like, you're not going to be like, Oh, well, I prefer this because like when I was 13, I oh, saw like wow. the best Pornhub video and I just like <laughs> came so hard. And now I just, that's all I want. Like most people aren't going to be able to like precisely put their finger on like why something turns them on. Right. Because when you start getting into like kinks and fetishes and preferences, like some of the things that people prefer, like, let's be honest, they're strange. Right. Um, it doesn't mean that they're bad, but like, where the fuck does it come from? I think it's a lot more about like consent between two partners. Right. So it's like, obviously like I'm very for like having these conversations and outlining. It's like, if you want to get, and the more taboo your preference is socially, and you know, when it's taboo, the more you have to get consent for it. Like obviously, right. The less taboo, the more like easily you can maybe like go into like more implied and stuff. But when it's really taboo, you like have to talk about it. Right. If you want to do like really intense, like race play, you obviously need to talk about it with your partner mm -hmm. beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. I think it, just to interject a little bit um, from like the kink community, right? When you're doing different kinds of play, obviously like there is an extensive amount of discussion that all happens between the two people. Are you, theoretically, like there should be rather. It's how, what the, the, how the community tries to teach people to do it, um, to talk about things and to get on the same page and to reach kind of some level of like um, informed consent. But I also feel like consent uh, does... Um, play into this a little bit because it is about um it, it's it, it's making me wonder is so uh, does it really boil down to intent like it doesn't matter like the, the motivation for doing these things because if we have like uh, if we have the partner that consents to being like fetishized or consents to whatever and they're fully aware and conscious etc and i mean does the intent and motivation still matter? The, the reason why the intent and motivation matters, and this kind of goes back to what uh, Erudite was saying, like, it, of course, it's gonna be very difficult to pinpoint like exactly like where this preference might have come from. But what you can do is you can just, you, you can kind of complement um, isolating certain valuables with like your emotional response to it. So you can like think about the whatever sex act or whatever dynamic that you're attracted to. And then you can try to think about, okay, what are the different variables? What are the different things that are involved in this act? And then think about, okay, if I if this was removed, how would I feel about the action? Okay, now if this was removed, how would I think about it? And then you can kind of isolate, okay, what parts about this specifically is it that I find like really interesting and how much of it is just kind of fluff that's just kind of been baked in there, maybe for more like, you know, personal experience or just force of habit or whatever. And then you can kind of isolate the specific things that you find to be uh, to, to be like what drives you to do so. And then from there, once you've realized, okay, so what is it specifically about this that makes it attractive? Well, it's the fact that you have, you know, let's say in the race play example, you have like a, you know, like a white person in a position of dominance. Okay. Is that really a good belief to have? And then you think about it. And now as for why that intent matters, is that like, I, like it's entirely possible that this thing only exists and expresses itself in that one aspect of consensual sexual interaction, in which case isn't really a big issue with it. But the issue is if you have like one of those beliefs, it is unlikely that's going to only express itself in like one domain in your life. And therefore it's likely that it might express itself like in your broader actions or in other interpersonal relationships or voting habits or, you know, whatever the fuck we're talking about. But yeah. I mean, I think something interesting about this is that we're in an ambivalent space where we can acknowledge that like no one is obligated to desire anyone else. No one has a right to be desired, but also that like the question of who is desired is a political question. It is related to sort of social norms and schemas and political histories. And so it's, it's difficult, like we can say, you know, oh, you should reflect and you should do this. And obviously there's also, you know, you should expose yourself to other things because maybe your preferences are just based on a lack of exposure to other things. But it's like, also from the point of view of a person who traditionally isn't viewed as desirable, like, you know, I don't think anyone really wants a mercy fuck either. Like, that's not what people want when it comes to desire. It's not like I want to have sex. It's like, I want to be desired. So this idea that we're, oh, I, you know what, I've really done the work and and before I found you repulsive and I wanted nothing to do with you, but I've really reflected on myself. And now I think you're appropriate for me to have sex with. Like it's, it's complicated. It's, it's more complicated than just like reflecting and then being like, mm, I didn't want to fuck that person before because I was a racist, but now I've thought about it and I guess I will. It's like, do you want to fuck that person who was a racist before they thought about it? 
Yeah, and we, we can make this more or less systemic question about things like representation or whatever and, and the importance of that in, in media and in, like you said, cultivating the social expectations and uh, standards for like who is desired and who isn't desired. And uh, yeah, if we want to take it in that direction of like discussing media representation, how that can like loop into the things that you're talking about, then I think that's absolutely an interesting conversation to go down. But yeah, I'm not sure if, if we want to do that or if we want to stick to the more, um, yeah, the more like micro things, I guess, that we're discussing so far. Uh, so just to be sorry, you, know, you can talk in just a second. You're saying don't feel any necessity to specifically glue, keep like glued to a topic. Uh, if the organic flow of the conversation is going a particular direction, or if somebody is not feeling like the vibe that two other people are having, and you really want to like talk about something, just like let me know or like DM me, hand like what the fuck ever, and we'll make it work. But don't feel like super glued to being on it, and don't feel like you need to uh, let people talk about something random if you really want to get. So what that. what are we talking about? Is it like the society's expectation of what's going to be attractive and how that is, you know, a socially constructed thing? To some degree, at least. Right? Is that what we're talking about then? Yeah, I think that's kind of where we're at. Now. Yeah, just kind of like what the influence of external stimuli or like, influ yeah, the influence of like things like external to your mind on how you desired people is like social, political. Uh, yeah, because the thing is, right, is like, yeah, it kind of sucks that there's some people in society that just for the luck of not being born and fitting the criteria of what is supposed to be attractive, um, you know they don't get fucked that's very unfortunate and that's sad for those people but also i feel pe there's a lot of pressure on people like you were sort of saying joe and like it's a very individualistic idea that you do the work and like you know you become better better person and all of a sudden you do want to fuck a fat person right it's like it's complete bullshit it's like we're wired a certain way you know i've got 35 years of wiring in my brain that makes me attracted to a certain thing whatever that is i can't just flip that on its head and go and have sex with someone that i find repulsive and it would just be horrible you know so I think there's a lot of pressure on people to like, like, the biggest thing is the trans thing, right? The biggest thing is like, you know, oh, if you have a genital preference, that's transphobic. And that to me is fucking bullshit because unfortunately we're wired a certain way. We can't really do much about that. And it's just kind of frustrating that all elements of sexuality are kind of considered okay and acceptable, except that one. And you're considered a bad person because, you know, you don't want to have sex with someone with certain genitalia, which I think is a totally fine boundary to have. You know, whether you question yourself on it or not, you know, if you don't want to have sex with someone with a particular genitalia, that's fine. I think that's that's not an issue. Yeah, I th think this is something that would be interesting to see if we all agree on. Uh, would we all agree that, like, people aren't individually, like, morally responsible necessarily for, like, their just, like, intuitive preferences of who they find attractive or who they don't find attractive? But we can say in time we can, like, criticize the broader systems and the culture that lead towards these attitudes, but we wouldn't tell, like, an individual person, like, hey, it's your job personally to go out of your way and, uh, like, behave this or this way in your sexual life in order to change this. We would probably just be more like, hey... Um, yeah, obviously these things have been, like Chad said, you know, like hardwired into you for however many years, and, and that sucks, that's unfortunate because it excludes a lot of people, but I'm not going to expect these, like, individuals to necessarily fix it all on themselves, we need to do this as, like, a broader cultural thing. Oh, sure, yeah, I mean, it's... Agree. I don't know why we... You have to be... Individual for it. Yeah, and you got to be careful when talking about, like, the plasticity of sexual desire, because, like... It's all well and good to say, oh, you should just like everyone. But like the idea that you can change preferences is also the sort of concept that underlies like conversion therapy for gay people. And this idea that you can just change people's preferences, like you have to be really careful about how far you're willing to push that. I think the, the, I issue, think the issue. issue is that like the neurological science about like sexual preferences is the jury's really still out, just like most things mm. in neuroscience. And so like making strong claims on either side of like preferences are really fluid. First of all, there's probably good evidence that like, for example, it seems to be the case that like more women and like, like cis born women, especially have more fluid sexual preferences. Um, and they, they can change a fair bit more over time, whereas men seem to be a lot more fixed. Um, but again, as we like do further research, this is going to like probably vary to what degree we believe either of these things. And so I think making like moral prescriptions about people's preferences when we don't even know why people have preferences or how they're created or how they maintain themselves feels preemptive. And yeah, the issue that isn't necessarily the, the preference in itself anyway, it's how you express it, right? So let's yeah. say, for example, you know, you aren't attracted to a certain person for whatever reason, you can just politely say no on a dating app or however you're meeting that person. 
but there's this desire sometimes to kind of directly express, I don't want to date you as an individual because of this characteristic you have, and that's fucked up. Like, why would you do that? That's just, like, rude, you know? Um, and it's just unnecessary. You could just politely say no, but it seems certain people have got this thing where they have to tell the person, you know, you're a trans woman, you're this race, you're, you're that, you know, identity, I, so I'm not interested. Yeah, I, I you don't identify as super straight, Chad. Yeah. No, I don't identify as super exactly. straight, no. <laughs> yeah, you gotta make clear. I, I mean, I also feel like that happens a lot in a positive direction. Well, the quote unquote positive direction where it's like, well, you know, I love X person like we were talking about because of the BBC or something like that before. And mm -hmm. it's like, wait. And it's like, it's not just like, oh, yeah, I don't like Asian women. And let me tell you on Twitter. It's also like, I really like this group of people for this reason. And let me tell you why. And it's like, well, that's, you know, still pretty weird that you're, you know, broadcasting this out in, the, in a way that can be like, you know, pretty hurtful to other people. Like, um, uh, at least in the black pill communities, they talk about it a lot. And it's definitely, I've seen it boil over into red pill and even very like normal average uh, people's shit where it's like the, they won't, they can't stop hearing about how every single woman alive likes tall men. And so it feels like if you're an average or below average height, dude, you're just not getting any love and shit like that. And I'm not saying women should stop saying they like tall men. It's just something that's like kind of brutal every day when you hear, mm. you know, a woman say, yeah, like when they list off their characteristics of men, almost ev the first thing every woman says is tall. And mm -hmm. it's like, okay, dude. And you're well, like, big issue you know, is like, like, like seven inches. I think is this thing yeah, half the time they're fucking go. lying, right? The right short guy that comes along and is charming yeah. and attractive, yeah. it won't actually fucking matter, right? 100%. Six foot bare minimum is a yeah. insane because that's like I don't know what is what is is that one full standard deviation above the average? Yeah, it's like a tiny fraction. It's a really silly thing to be like. I'm gonna limit myself to a very small pool of men. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, so this is an issue is like, especially when we're in like younger populations, precise specifically, when people even state their preferences, half the time that shit ain't even true. It's yep. purely what they've like, they're like LARPing because of society yeah. is like told them whatever it is. Yeah, they're and then you like chest, look at who they of. date and it's like never that, right? Like a lot of girls, like, I just want really emotionally available men. And then they date yep. nasty the men <laughs> over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And then when emotionally available men, not just like creepy nice guys, but like actually really like solid, solid healthy men come along, they're like, eh, not my cup of tea, right? And so it's like, this is another thing is like people's preferences aren't actually what they necessarily say they are. They're how they're, people, people are what they behave, not necessarily what they say they are. Yeah, there's yeah, a huge discussion. That, that, Sorry. Yes, no, I mean, if you want to go ahead, but um, uh, that's part of the, the pushback that I give to the stuff about the height and stuff is uh, especially the difference between IRL and online. Mm -hmm. Online, it can be very brutal because there'll be people that reject you for like, oh, fuck, I had a conversation with somebody that was talking about how they would never be on, in, in a relationship with somebody who, um, you know, didn't know how to type right. Um, that their like grammar was bad in typing and stuff. Uh, but they, when they've interacted with people inside of their personal life, they've met people who are bad at typing and found out they were bad at typing later. And it wasn't that big of a deal. Like it's, it's just like something you can intuitively think of in your brain. First meeting somebody is going to be wildly different in the things you're willing to accept in comparison to like later down the line. If you meet somebody and they're like picking their nose, a lot of people are going to be, eh, whatever. You know, that's kind of weird. But like if somebody, your partner of three years picks their nose, it's not like you're going to go pack your bags, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> You know, it's going to be massively different. And I think online, uh, honestly, a lot of it is cope. You'll hear guys say, she needs to have a thin waist, big ass, fucking whatever shit. And it's like, no, nah, they're just, you know, chill or whatever. When it comes to IRL dating, they'll just date somebody they think is cool. Yeah. But for, like you said, first impressions and stuff really matter because I wonder if there's like a way to, to like mentally visualize this in a good way. But it's like everything you do in the very beginning, and this is for like literally everything in life, is going to matter and play much more of a significant role in other people's perception of, or sorry, in your perception of like those other people than what happens later because like the, the more you go on the more impressions you get from this person the more you find out about them the more you can like build up like a aggregate bulk of information about this person and now if like a new thing comes in there like they pick their nose that's now relatively such a small piece of like the broader puzzle and everything else you know about them whereas if that's like yeah. one of the first things you find out about them that might make up like 50 or 30 percent of the impressions that you've gotten about this person and therefore it's going to like yeah. weigh on you more heavily but, yeah, yeah. 
But I think there's a really interesting point, even like about the height thing, and and it's true in the research that's done on Grinder as well, is that like these explicitly stated desires about immutable characteristics feed into our ideas of like social hierarchy as well. So the idea of what a man is, is now if, to be a real man, you have to be at least six foot. And that is reinforced every time yeah. it's said. So like, I'm, I'm a 5'10 woman and like my biggest, is, I, ha I have no height preferences, but I do notice that whenever I'm around like a 5'11 guy, if I'm wearing high heels, it's like the end of the world, the end of the world. And like, I understand why completely. And it has nothing to do with me and it has nothing to do with them not liking me in heels and everything to do with this idea that has extended past this explicit dating norm to the whole idea of masculinity. Suddenly to be a man and to be a valuable man, you have to be six foot. And the same thing happens in the queer community where this hierarchy evolves based on sexual preferences, which always puts white cis um, gay men at the top of the hierarchy based on how people explicitly put their preferences in, in on Grindr. Yeah, there's... I think there's a good thing there with like uh, acknowledging where some of that height preference comes from, at least from my like people I know, um, a lot of women I know will have this height preference, not really for any, like, uh, not like an actual preference, but just because they might have been like low key traumatized by dating that one guy who was like an inch shorter and is really insecure yeah. about his height. And that just kind of ruined everything from then on. But like, um, I think there's always like a kind of reverse you can think about when that happens, because depending on how it's communicated, if someone says, Oh, I thought you were cool, but then I realized you were five seven, like fuck off dwarf or whatever. And then like, are you really gonna stay attracted to that person? Like, do you want that person yeah. in your life when they talk to you like that? Like, probably not, right? Mm -hmm. Omitting like leaving out the whole like lie aspect. Uh, let's say you got catfished with regards to height on like an app, or even like uh, like let's say you met somebody through Twitch, right? Uh and they said they were six two, but they're actually like five eleven. Would how I would that affect sorry, good. Per personally I wouldn't care but the thing i would maybe care about honestly when people do that is like why the fuck the are you lie. lying about your height yeah, yeah. the lie yeah. I, I think if but i also women feel like did it, it, makes... it would be weird right yeah. like if a woman lied yeah. about her height that would be weird yeah. if a guy lies about his height to be honest i expect it in online yeah. dating because yeah. we keep telling men that they have to be six feet so men yeah. need to get any option of date like unironically to get it's options five eleven just say you're six foot just say it yeah. and you're like eh, yeah. five nine six foot it's the same thing right yeah i was gonna say with this question you're about to break up like 50 percent of relationships in america because most women <laughs> i'm sorry to tell you your man is not fucking five ten six foot whatever he says that's just not the case all right yeah. go to his what about appointments and figure what out about women's it. weight hell yeah, it's the same thing, but I you can't tell on sight. That's what I mean. Like yeah. this, I I couldn't tell someone's height looking at them, it's even difficult. based it's off hard. my height. Yeah. So we're yeah, calling I, men I, liars, I, right? What about women in the fucking close up? Women with the, lie you about know, their weight, you know. And no it's like, oh yeah, I'm so slim. Look at my face. We Look at it. my face. You hate women. And... We get I hate it. Fat women, get it right, okay? <laughs> oh, here's a weird thing, right? Is that when people, when women set a height standard for men, it's kind of just socially accepted as like a thing. But if men set a weight standard, even though weight is significantly more mutable than height, in fact, height is like very immutable um people kind of like lose their shit a lot of the time and think it's like really offensive which is an extremely strange double standard that we kind of play in the dating market um where it's Ooh. like some preferences about immutable characteristics apparently are fine um but others are not because of like it feels like a lot of like post hoc justifying of like why these things aren't okay um which is a a strange dynamic yeah, I think there's maybe, I do have a bit of pushback. Like, I do agree that the high weight thing is, like, of course, is a double standard. But I think when people try to equate the two, like, yeah, you can say, like, weight is mutable, even though it's kind of understood that once you're, like, at a certain weight, like, the chances of you losing it are quite low. Also, just that, like, there isn't, like, height does hurt people as a standard, but it's never hurt people nearly as much as the weight standard has like whether it's True. like going back like since the 1700s when doctors would just recommend like daily purges to their patients you know um and mm -hmm. yeah like i don't think you have quite the same like emotional well, yeah. impact and then especially the, on the gender gender territory of like losing weight is there's kind of this weird conundrum about this as well because yes when so there's a couple things to talk about right first of all your set point is like so your number of fat cells is determined in puberty and so the most important thing to do when you're raising kids, by the way, is to make sure that they're s slim and healthy 
all through puberty because you have a set point of fat cells. It, you're maxed out. And so if you have really high fat cells when you're young, losing weight is always going to be more difficult for you. But then there's this also trade-off of typically the reason why people have a really hard time going below their set point is because relapse for weight loss is really high. It's very common to relapse, right? And so like now we're getting into this difficult territory. I, I agree that broadly a lot of people are treated more poorly because of their weight, absolutely, than height. Um, there's a lot more implicit stuff that happens with height than there is explicit stuff with weight, right? Um, but we're getting into this difficult territory where it's like, well, it's still mutable. And I get that you're getting treated poorly, but like, are, sh should these things be equated or should they not? Or should we just say like people can have their preferences and that it's fine? Like, yeah. So like, are, you saying like women... should, are you saying we should determine if one is okay or one is not based off like how it affects like the group? in question i, don't think I, I mean i'm very big on like anyone's preferences are fine i think you can have preferences just be realize that the more narrow your preferences are the more narrow your dating landscape is and people are allowed to feel some sort of way about your preferences that's also mm. fine right mm -hmm. um that's kind of my rule because i don't know how else to solve these kind of weird things that's like you're right it's hard to equate height and weight but they're there are good heuristic that we have to compare between the two groups. I think one difference as well to hinge on what like to uh, further like talk about what Lonerbox is talking about, about how, you know, even though they, they seem on a surface level to be very similar there, if you look at it a little bit more, there are pretty significant differences in between the height and the weight stuff. Now, both are of course really significant and both really affect the, like the affected groups in, in very significant ways, especially when we talk about dating. But I think there's also an importance in discussing like the gendered aspect of it. Like if you talk about physical appearance, so things that would include for example, like height and weight. When you think about how much that makes up of how we societally value women versus how we societally value men, it makes up a much larger portion of how we societally value women than what we do men. So something like, for example, weight, which is has to do with appearance, that's like, you know, not going in uh, is not in, uh, yeah, is, is not going well for like a specific woman is going to affect her in her broad life, probably a lot more significantly than something that's going to adversely affect a man's appearance, uh, is going to affect him as he's viewed broadly, because men are a lot more valued for other things as well that go beyond appearance. So for example, like career and achievements and stuff like that, whereas women are often very, very much valued, um, for their appearance above a lot of other things, but this is changing. This is, you know, becoming more and more balanced, but yeah, there's, I think there's still like that discrepancy that that's worth recognizing. I would totally Anything? agree in more, most dating landscapes. The issue is that in online dating, it seems like that ha isn't entirely the case. And like for online dating specifically, I would say both groups are really closely evaluated for like their physical appearance mm. and aesthetic. Yeah, we're talking about dating um, specifically. Yeah. Yeah, like online dating specifically. Mm -hmm. I thought we were talking about height like posted in online dating. So that's kind of what I was narrowing in on. Um, but yeah, I would agree that like the reason why weight for women is such a difficult issue is because women are viewed as more sexual object and there's this value inherently attached to a woman's attractability. That's why older women are not valued the way that older men are because mm -hmm. older women are less sexually attractive and less sexually viable, right? Um, which is is just the reality that we live in. Yeah, I think one of the major ways, and this uh, is about something that Irrelevant talked about before, uh, by which we can work towards resolving this, and this is like a, a very difficult thing, but uh, like Irrelevant said, right, if, if somebody uh, comes up and says like, oh, you know, I'm only dating people that are, you know, six foot, blah, 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 and then like these like entire like stat D and D character sheet, right, of like who they're being, <laughs> like willing to date. Um, ideally, this is probably not somebody that most people, if they can look at it in a vacuum, would like, okay, I probably don't want to date this person, right? Because they seem extraordinarily picky. There are also some like, you know, uh, potentially like shallow qualities over there where they're like min max in their dating preferences and putting like a fuck ton of effort into that. Um, however, the reason why this still like hits really hard is because, hey, if you are like a, if, if you're having trouble with like dating your relationships, you know, it doesn't really help if you can be like, okay, well, you know, I didn't want this person anyway, because they seem to be like pretty shallow in terms of like these types of things when, you know, it, it, like the, the loneliness is something that that really yeah that really creeps in and it really affects them and especially when it comes to a lot, how a lot of people view like a relationship as something that they need to complete their kind of puzzle for self-esteem yeah. it becomes very difficult to say those types of things but then thereby by trying to improve people's self-esteem and being like hey um 
try to develop yourself and put yourself in a position where a relationship doesn't like complete you in terms of who you are as a person and is more of an amendment to you. That way you can develop a self-esteem that makes you feel better about these types of things. So if you have some person go up and be like, oh, I'm not dating you unless you feel all these like 63 preferences of mine, you can just be like, holy shit, you're actually like insane and then move on and it not negatively affect you. But the issue is if, if you don't, if the self-esteem isn't there, that's still going to affect you because they're still like, you know, fuck, you know, like this is, yeah, this isn't going my way. So I think this is great. I think we should... I think we should encourage this like positive approach to everything, right? Because we can look at um, a larger woman. Maybe she's just like a healthier, like a, a more buxom, like busty, like larger woman, right? Um, and maybe, maybe Chud comes out as a feeder, right? Her and Chud are the <laughs> happiest thing in the world together, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, he's... Uh, how tall are you, Chud? You, uh, you, met, you admitted uh -oh. that you're an insult. I'm, 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 I'm the rare six-foot insult. Oh shit! Oh wow! All right, Nine, so by the way, only five six. Ten. Five Clearly ten. honest, the most honest person on this panel. Um, yeah, you want like, to get the measuring tape out? I'm gonna have to when yeah, I come on camera yeah, at some yeah, point. I'm gonna have to do yeah, it. Yeah, can I? you stand yeah. by? Wait, what was, was like, the thing in your Discord? Cell with two kids. <laughs> yeah. there, there's something in your Discord where like some guy stood up in like his yeah, bathroom pause, stall right. or like oh. shower curtains and shit. That was funny as fuck. Yeah. Chad, your um, next background should be that you know. Infrared. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, your next yeah, background yeah, yeah. should be that, you know, the thing that all the criminals line up on when they're, like, taking photos? Oh, like, yeah. That should be your next wallpaper, <laughs> so you can, like, see the six-foot thing. It's, like, at your shoulders, you know? But, yeah. Yeah, mentally, I just had an uh, image of, like, Chud and some other VTuber that he's, like, quarreling with, doing, like, a side-by-side -side of their VTubers to see who's taller. Kind of like that one photo of, like, Destiny and Huzz. Oh, yeah. Classic. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think from like this first question, I think the the key things that we have like taken as takeaways are that like your consciousness of like the I guess like the 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 meta of your sexuality or meta sexuality of yourself and like communication. You're like it, encouraging like introspection, self reflection, and like an internal dialogue that's honest to try to like lead uh, towards like a progression in your sexuality. Maybe it seems like that's kind of like the takeaway actually feel yeah, the opposite right. bryce i okay. think we agreed that it's like not like that's great but it's not all on the individual to cater their sexual preferences to the political vibe of the day like oh, there's only yeah. so much extent like it's great to be reflective in your sexual life of course everyone should just be doing that as a baseline and it's yeah that's what i meant like as like a baseline thing, kind of uh, like sorry good it's not on you to right the wrongs of the world by fucking people you're not naturally attracted to yeah. Right. I think that's kind of like a broad thing for our society that we kind of need to embrace and really accept. Not every single fucking action that you take has to be a step in a moral direction, right? Like you don't have to be fighting some kind of fight with every single thing. And I also don't know that like really need to find like a lot of meaning in everything, right? Like why do, why does meaning have to be deep? Why do, why do you have to have so much meaning with regards to like, why do I like this? Like, you know, like, uh, I think intent and motivation can color it in like a positive or negative way. And in the sense that, it's not always the case that it's bad or evil or whatever, but in some cases, the intent and motivation can show that it can be like an unhealthy or bad or thing that should merit that introspection, et cetera, and evaluation. But at the same time, like, if I, if I get off from a girl crying, like, I'm not going to get too... <laughs> I'm not going to get, like, too, uh, like, super introspective. Is that a normal like, thing? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty normal. I mean, well, off get off a girl crying? Like, anything, anything. The kinks or fetish is like normal. I have people I mean... throwing themselves at me. <laughs> 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 what you mean, like in actual distress? I mean, obviously, no, you no, know, there's like... a pain shit, but you it's know, I literally like, cry. like say the grandmother's cry. died and they're in tears, and you're like, <laughs> oh yeah, it's time. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh fuck, I'm all bricked up at this funeral. Yeah, does um, this church yeah. have bathrooms? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, <laughs> yeah. oh Jesus, yeah. Uh, no, it, it's it's pretty normal. Like, dec I think it's called like dacrophilia. Um, it's Damn. a good question. Like, of like, I, I'm what a, is I'm not going to lie to you, homie. Books. Everyone's going to read into the fact you had it off the top. Yeah. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah the the mask clip. The mask clip. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hey, that's okay. I'm the, probably like the most like open and comfortable guys when it comes to this stuff. Like, I'm perfectly. Yeah, like Jeez. the reason why I know that is because like I literally am a dacrophiliac. Like, I literally 
am that um oh the revelations oh, okay. let's go yeah yeah so yeah sharing that's one of my kinks it's a, it's a fetish that gets a lot of like whoa you know, did you ask us for consent before you projected your kinks upon us what is this oh, Bryce? He's not doing his kink right now on us oh he's my just God. sharing about his personal oh life. shit is that way about sharing <laughs> is that way about two incels into this chat room full of yeah. people also yeah, isn't it isn't right? affiliate <laughs> Isn't affilia like generally considered to be a bad thing, like some sort of disorder? No, no, it's just it's no, just I like know. all the philias are classified as like different types of like sexual. So the philias specifically are typically like they're such a strong fetish. Oftentimes they're like, they're almost like orientational in level, like you need them to get off. Um, mm. So I'm not sure if that's precisely like the level um because i think a lot of people when they're using the philia language especially more in like bdsm land they're including like kinks to like pretty strong fetishes all under philias am i understanding that correctly bryce yeah there's um philia is just like a clinical term it's not really like there's there's like a good or bad thing about it this is just like a clinical term that describes but all the philias are bad it, you know necrophilia well, no pedophilia. that's a moral thing that, that's you in the good yeah, one society true. So there's some there has to be a good like one, views right? is really bad, like pedophilia, right? But um, and and specifically, what are some good pedophilia. ones? What are some good ones? Come yeah, on, necrophilia. Is fine. If the partner's consenting in a BDSM role play, that's fine. Wait, but that wait, wait necrophilia is fucking a dead body. How can you consent to that? Wait, what? I thought you said decrophilia, like what? Bryce oh said. no, I I was like, wait, are we are <laughs> yeah, we cool with killing? I heard necrophilia. Yeah, I was like, oh shit, I was like, way too shit. similar in, in sound. All right. Wait, yeah. like, isn't is, 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 it depends on what kind of crying though, right? But I thought like decrophilia is quite normal. Like, how many fucking porn videos are there of like women crying when they're getting throat fucked and like shit like that? Or there's a, the other side, which is like the vulnerability side, where it's like I don't know if you ever like fucked someone like just after crying with them over something like that's pretty hot but i don't know if that's like the same what do you mean bryce like can you specify um, yeah so yeah, tell uh, us, bryce. Yeah. Like, <laughs> listen as, as avoiding as much graphic detail as possible yeah it's literally it's comparable to what loner said like there, there's crying where it's basically like the tear ducts are like f uh, physically triggered from like the act of like what he described or uh, there are situations where like it's just like um okay, okay honestly there, there are honestly like a, a number of different ones but obviously the, the key thing is that it's not distress it is not as chud uh identified it so it's uh, clearly if somebody is in like emotional distress or like clearly upset uh something like that that is not the case it's usually more um it's like the aesthetic of it kind of yeah the aesthetic and honestly there's another kind that is honestly okay how do i phrase this that's too, too us safe sometimes after you have so much fun together with a, a nice lady that she will cry afterwards and it's like a cathartic cry and it's like a like a release and it's like wow like this is this is awesome wait i think you've been misled there mate to be honest no no, no, no i swear more. to god i swear to god i swear <laughs> up and down i swear <laughs> to god it is a thing i swear <laughs> to god Oh. No, no, but it makes sense. It can be like a like a kind of like like aftercare release type of thing. I would imagine that's kind of more what it is, right, Bryce? Yeah. So it, basically, it's um, kind of like if you guys have heard of it. It's a little bit of cringe. It's like a French phrase, the uh, la petite mort, like the little oh, yeah, little, little death. death. Yeah. So basically, it's like they have such an intense experience physiologically that they're just like, oh my god, like I. Uh, my emotions are now like pouring out of me. It's like a cathartic release. Like they just hit like a, a breaking point and just everything pours out. Yeah. In Arabic, it's uh, aburni, which means bury me. It's like an ex bury like a very me. expression. Oh yeah, shit. Yeah. And nice. just All to be clear, uh, it's interesting that the BDSM uses philias because typically philias in a clinical sense would imply that there's some level of like distress or dysfunction as a result yeah, of this sexual interest. But why, why I was bridging is I understand that the BDSM community often use philias to describe their interests. So it's not causing them dysfunction, particularly because they're typically in, I mean, the consent packages for like BDSM, from my understanding, is like... <laughs> really intense so it's very very clear on what they're all consenting to and they're all interested in it's not causing them dysfunction because they're typically deriving i mean if, and if someone if someone's shitting in your mouth that's pretty dysfunctional and you're getting off on it that's pretty dysfunctional oh, how is that not okay, necessarily, not necessarily yeah. Yeah. why are you being such a prude yeah chud <laughs> because that's what fucked fuck? up you can get that you can get ill from that you could get sick. You? If someone, bro, you Not if you gargle hand, hand sanitizer time. afterwards. Chad, on the Chad, panel. Chad logic. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. Like, you don't have to be into it, right? But that doesn't make it like like you find it gross because you're not into it, which is fine. I also find it gross, right? I don't like shit at all. I think it's 
gross. But the reality is like the idea that somebody could just get off to it and then consent to the risks inherent to whatever their like sexual kinks and interests are. I don't know. I'm just kind of like, I don't give a fuck what people do in the bedroom. Like, isn't that like the whole point of like, Wait, like yeah. okay. gay rights so then, and like all of the sexual, like some liberties that we've gotten is like, just do whatever the fuck you want. Just get consent yeah. first, please. There's a difference Can between I just can you show up and shit in someone's mouth? Don't fuck kids or dead bodies. If, 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 no, no, no. If, wait, 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 I, I was about to say that. Wait, what about that? What about necrophilia then? What if yeah, I can say, like, I want to die? It, I yeah, mean, I, I agree with you, Relly, in die, terms but... of like, necrophilia is more complicated because it, it demonstrates one of the limitations of consent as a sexual ethic because if you look at things like the german cannibal case or the case where the boys dug up the body of the girl and then they all got charged with attempting to rape a corpse it's like the harm that's done through necrophilia is much more difficult to quantify in terms of like actual harm, like a, a consent harm it doesn't make sense in that sort of way and even in terms of like the german cannibal case where the guy consented so much you can't really consent to being murdered. So necrophilia is difficult because it's like, are you talking about someone who wants to die and you want to get off on murdering them? Because that's one issue. Or are you talking about fucking an already dead body? Because that's another issue. But, and right, okay, consent so... doesn't cover either of them in terms of quantifying them as a harm. Wait, but, why can I consent to suicide, but I can't consent to somebody else killing me? Can you? You can't always consent to suicide. I mean, you, you, you can you consent can, to yourself. Some, well, yeah, yeah, but you... Suicide's still technically illegal, I think, even though obviously you can't be charged for it. Um, but like murdering another person and and taking well, we're talking away morally, their economy. Not about laws. Well, laws and morals relate to one another because laws yeah. are based on ethics. Well, so, yeah. well like, kind of. But you don't have um, you don't have laws yeah. that are like. Yeah, but look, we, 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 we wouldn't say we yeah. wouldn't say that uh, Bryce's fucking kink is like illegal therefore they no but he's not it. he's not taking away someone's right to life right to life we know is contentious in any area whether right. it's assisted suicide whether it's abortion right. definitely in the case of killing someone for sexual gratification but the, the, it, they're really good test cases for the limitations of consent as an ethics for sexual activity okay right what if you got someone that goes to <laughs> fucking go. what's it called that Let's place where it. you get euthanasia right yeah. and they're yeah. like i don't care what you do with my body after i'm dead i'm so fucking bad i just want to be end it all and the doctor who's a bit of a kinkster says well do you mind if i fuck your dead body and the guy says yes that's fine and then they get fucking euthanized and the doctor hops on him and fucks him is that okay or not i that's think that the, the, the reason that's a good question this is not <laughs> yeah, answer. Think about it, like, okay. i think when you, when you the answer is like... arrest him execute him <laughs> <fucked up. laughs> <laughs> wait hold on <laughs> i can't believe you want that like, like, dead patients Come we're on. getting into the issue again which is like a lot of morality is fundamentally arbitrary and subjective right so why necrophilia is a large problem is it violates the social contract because we've all decided as a society mostly historically that it was really fucking bad and everyone still feels enough of that way that it's really fucking bad and creepy and deranged that we still decide that it's morally bad but like when we're getting to specifically like sexual morality these things are fundamentally always going to be like arbitrary because they're always going to be socially construed and created and so like the reason why it's a problem is because basically enough of society feels that it is a harm but yeah there are arguments <laughs> it's the same argument for like incest between like um gay twins or whatever like what's the whole like there's literally no harm and they're both consenting and they're both adults right like it's hard to oh argue why that's a problem okay, but that but doesn't change it in our social contract we still view it as a problem right? i think there's one more element to this that's i think it's important to discuss because uh there are a lot of like general systems and general institutions and rules that the things we're talking about are interacting with so if you just like located like an isolated incidence in a vacuum like a doctor exists and a patient exists and the patient is dying and the doctor's like hey mind if i fuck you after you're dead like that's one thing but if this is operating within like a medical institutions where we have rules and regulations in place for good reasons regarding the handling of dead bodies and you know patients corpses and stuff after their death and how that relates to consent of the family and how it relates to you know sanitation and health guidelines and minimizing the risks for like you know disease or whatever the fuck and stuff like that to spread then you can make like a like a direct argument for like hey this leads to bad outcomes instead of more like a like, general thing oh we just find this is icky and therefore we don't allow it in society and the same thing goes for things like you know maybe like like bestiality and, and necrophilia especially if like this person was at the state where they had been buried right there's a significant risk there where we might say oh well it's like consensual because the only uh, a, a, a agent there capable of consent 
is wants to do this thing and that body is dead so therefore no longer has consent therefore doesn't have to consent but the issue there is that that interaction if that person catches like a fucked up disease that you get from fucking dead humans or animals or whatever they can spread that on to other people then in society and then they're reaping the like the negative effects from like an interaction that occurred there and therefore we probably wouldn't say that that's okay but, yeah. Wasn't that that's a monkey even you did it clean fucking Catching shit in your mouth? Wasn't that Chud's argument? You can catch yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, true. It's, 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 well, if it's, just gargle some hand way. sanitizer afterwards. Like, come on, it's gonna be okay. You can argue that's how it's <laughs> developed, but it's to do with humans, what humans morally view naturally as wrong or right based on the social norm of the time. And maybe that's how it developed. But even if someone was like, we have a completely clean way to fuck horses and that's, you know, it's completely sanitary, nothing will, people would still be like, it's, it's weird and wrong. But I mean, bestiality and necrophilia and cannibalism are great ways to demonstrate how weak consent is as a framework for sexual ethics. Yeah, and this is what the you Nazis are right about, like, by the way. This degeneracy, okay, can, is out yeah. of control. Well, <laughs> Who knew you would be the prude, honestly? Wait, 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 wait we you get can also, well, cause you can... a corpse. What are you talking about? Is yes. that prudish, though? Oh, I don't want someone to shit in my mouth. I don't want to stop being such a prude. Is that the level we're wait, at now? Wait, not shit in your oh, mouth, Jesus Chad. Christ. Nobody's forcing, nobody's for saying that you need to have shit in your mouth, okay, Chad? But, you're, you're but the idea that I'm against it apparently is cringe. Like, no, I'm sorry, some of this stuff is fucked up, okay? You've never tried it. You've never tried it. Not I for it was cringe. It's Nobody a... said it was cringe. I also agree that it's kind of gross. The difference is I'm not going to tell somebody that they can't put shit in their mouth necessarily. Like, I'm not willing to do that, right? But as a society, we are willing to tell people you can't fuck dead bodies. We are willing to do that. Maybe in 20 years, we'll all be like, you know what? Shit in the mouth specifically, we're also going to decide that that's not okay. And you can't even consent to that, right? Like, maybe. I think that's like, that's also a good place for the, uh, hey, like the, like the rule consequential, because you could say that, like, even though there might not be any immediate harm between someone consenting to have their corpse fucked and then it happening, but then it's like, okay, well, maybe there's not immediate harm, but then like, okay, what does the world look like if you try to institutionalize that or like normalize it? What kind of agreements do you have to draw up? Or like, are you kind of, are we setting a social standard that consent now can sometimes equal equal consent later or if the example with the doctor happens then it's like well maybe the consequence of that long term is that people won't want to go to that doctor because of what happens there and then people uh are more likely to not get treatment and yeah there's all kinds of like good and bad outcomes shit some shit's just fucking weird okay uh, here's, the okay. point okay. is those hey, fucking weirdness is... I'm trying the to make your is, point less shit. doesn't right. matter. Yeah, the, the, point, but the point is of all of these cases is that you can try and like manipulate it and say it's a consent thing, but it's not a consent thing. Our objections to bestiality and necrophilia don't make sense when you try and push them into consent because animals don't consent to being slaughtered en masse for our consumption. And dead bodies are Here fucking we go. dead. The vegan so talking point. Yeah, we go. got vegan. Let's go. <laughs> Fuck it. I'm ready. Right, but I'm saying if you're objecting to bestiality on the the idea that it harms an animal then you can't believe in mass animal manufacturing consumption that that's not the argument against bestiality you can try and pretend it is but it's not the argument against bestiality is it's gross to fuck animals and we don't do it well unless and you are a vegan in that case you can still it's say there's a consent. difference Wait, when you're talking about to eat shit why do why can't we well, eat but that's what i'm saying then why can't we do both you can outlaw can. eating shit if you want to yeah. outlaw eating <laughs> shit. But you, you can't no, say wait. the issue with eating shit is consent, right? So That's wait, all I'm then, saying is can... that these things we say are consent. Yeah. Like, you can't fuck an animal because an animal can't consent. An animal can't consent to all sorts of shit, and we do it anyway. It's not to do with consent. It's right. to do with the fact so... we think fucking animals is gross. So, so if that's... you want to – if Chad, wait, so then... Chad's theocracy yeah, yeah. wants to, to ban eating shit, <laughs> then that can happen. But we don't have Chad's <laughs> theocracy yet. We yeah. have a Wait, very so then, liberal. The authoritarian hellhole of shit's the animals. So I'm uh, gonna, yeah. I got the green light to fuck animals? No, you don't. Be, it's no. not my. It's not, it's not, it's fuck whatever you want, I guess. But illegal. the social contract, yeah, says that you can. Oh, so whatever okay, the law so says I'm, goes. So then, yeah, no. so then, I'm I'm, then let's oh, talk man. about us specifically. Is it Here's okay you in me. view for me to pipe down a horse? Yeah. I don't think it's I, I'm not okay, being I don't think that would be ethical. Wait, wait, wait. Everybody's talking at once, yeah. Or not good. Why are we like I feel I feel like there's some maybe it's for memes. I'm not totally sure how to read it, but I feel like everyone here is like pretty intelligent enough to understand like how social contracts work and how like morals de derive from them from a broadly utilitarian and semi-contractual state, right? That's how we've derived most of our policy of what is like good or bad, both at a legal level, which some represents it, but of course the law isn't all there is to morality. 
And then there's other things like other social contracts. For example, like we'd think it's probably pretty immoral for like Chud to run around, like say he like took somebody to date and then started screaming about how her like pussy smells really bad. We'd probably all say that that's really bad. It's not illegal, but we well, might say it's that true, it's like, immoral well, to do. Probably still people would say that that's yeah. like violating the social contract, right? And so like- I didn't obviously- sign a contract if some bird's pussy stinks. That's, I'm gonna that's a point of a social board. contract. You don't sign it. A social contract is something oh, you are born into. <laughs> you can opt out of the social contract, right? By by becoming, as she said, a sovereign citizen. But everyone is born into it, and you're encultured into it, right? You know what it is because you're culturated, which is in part why when people from different cultures immigrate, it can actually be really diff- difficult for them because these social contracts have changed, and most social contracts are implied and learned. Could you not say that, that? But that's that's why there's like a good reason for the for the bestiality, like social contract thing. Because even though you can say that eating meat is causing harm, the person who eats meat isn't gaining pleasure from like the pain of the animal uh, being farmed and dying. They're gaining pleasure from the meat. Whereas the bestiality guy is like directly gaining pleasure from violating the consent well, of that. No, animal. Well, there's whoa, 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 whoa. no, 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 no. Animals don't. Animals don't pay. Listen, yeah, they're the okay, beast you pay extra. Sorry, I'm the bestiality expert on this panel, okay. and I'd like to say that animals don't have a conception of consent. You keep animals as pets. They don't consent to that. They don't consent to being killed. Animals don't have the same human concept of conscious consent. They don't operate in that way. It is, a, I think, uh, M- uh, McCain said that an animal consents as long as he's the one giving, not receiving. These concepts we have of human sexuality don't apply to animals. Consent does not map onto animals. And you also, like, if an animal can receive, it, like, Mr. Hands is a really famous bestiality case. And there's a beautiful documentary on it. As a bestiality expert, I recommend it. Um, and he liked getting fucked by horses and ended up dying because of it. But there is no harm that came to that horse. That is still something that we would consider to be morally wrong, socially wrong, that it would still be considered illegal. There's no harm associated to it. These utilitarian or consent-based... It's, it's, well, actually, it's very touching documentary. It's quite sad. But... Um, but the whole idea of like trying to map these human concepts of consent and these things we've used to structure our society onto animals, it just shows how inapposite consent can be for sexual ethics. Yes, we can say bestiality is wrong, but not on the grounds of consent and not on the grounds of harm. Because well, you I could would say, say you consent, do no? get pleasure. No, you animals can't consent. Yeah, animals, exactly. But that's what you can wait. Have, yeah, but, but you, wait, hold on, hold on. Maybe I misunderstood. Rabbit, yeah, maybe I misunderstood. Reads the constitution. But, but didn't you say? Didn't you say that you can't say that? Oh, bestiality is bad because of consent because we do it in like meat stuff. Or maybe I misunderstood your argument. Then. I, I'm I, what, yeah, sorry. What I'm saying is that consent. You can say bestiality is bad, but okay. not on the grounds of consent. Wait, why not? there is no concept that animals have of consent. Animals don't consent to anything yeah. with us, to being our pets, to being on farms, to being eaten. Yeah, exactly. So they therefore, because have... they, they can't consent, therefore we shouldn't have sex with them. Yeah, but don't, I mean, don't, I mean, I'm pretty no, sure. No, like, no, 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 I want, I want to ask, that's why I wanted to ask, because maybe you probably, I imagine you know more about this than me, but isn't the main reason we don't allow, like, sex with kids because they don't have a concept of consent? Yeah, they But that's consent. human beings, where, where they have consciousness and they will have the ability to understand that situation through a framework of consent as they get older. There, there are concepts so of autonomy and, and social and relations. And the derived measurable harm that we know that it does, right? We so, have enough sequelae evidence to know that like when adults have sex with kids, even if the kids say yes at the time, it still seems to have some pretty major impacts when they become adults, right? So we like also have some quantified measure of harm that's being done. Okay. Yeah. So if we're bringing harm wait, into wait. the... Oh, sorry, go ahead. There's go ahead. A, I just say, because I, I may not be like, it's a difficult topic, but there is a book by Joseph Fischel called Screw Consent. He's the head of sexuality at Yale. He goes through the bestiality argument. He goes through Mr. Hands. He goes through corpse fucking. He goes through cannibalism. So if anyone is interested, it, there's PDFs online. It's free. Screw Consent by Joseph Fischel. So wait, then was the argument against fucking kids about whether like later in life it'd be bringing trauma onto them and fucking with them was that was that the primary the argument hum- or what else would it there's was multiple it? arguments the human being, yeah okay. there's so yeah at least for that argument then when wouldn't couldn't you say then that if you could prove that a kid was gonna die yeah you said like a terminal really disease soon exactly. yeah that you could just fuck them 
and well, they're not going to become conscious because they're going to die in 24 hours, so I can fuck this kid. So there's measurable no, harm done yes. later in life, but there's also pretty measurable harm done immediately. Right? For example, kids who have experienced a fair bit of sexual abuse have an exceedingly high heart rate, like crazy high heart rate. And we know that because they're typically in a very hypervigilant state. Because when you are small and little and prepubescent, sex is very painful, especially if it's penetrative, right? Um, it is very distressive, distressing. They don't really fully know what's going on. And so like there are some measurable harms, especially like it's it's when we're talking about kids, we have this whole issue of like developmental range. So like harm measured at three is going to look a lot different than measured at 16. Um, but even though there's this long-term sequelae for society, there's also this immediate impact, for example, just with heart rate alone. We know that it causes extreme hypervigilance within the body. But that's probably the same, true for like most animals as well. Should that would like where that's happen, right? Yeah, I, I'm not, I have no idea. I don't, I don't. I, know I would imagine, like, if you have like a. Can you I, give I me, <laughs> Rose? Rose, yes. can you give me an example of an animal consenting? Uh, no, I can't give they you cannot an consent. Of a kid consenting either, though. What about dolphins? That's not true. Apparently, it's there's a guy that talked to dolphin, and he said what, that the dolphin seemed up. No, we're not. We're not <laughs> talking about sex. We're talking about literally having the concept of consent. Yeah, animals as can't consent. Can animals can't consent. Yes, I, I, animals so, have so, no so, understanding of what consent is. Exactly, and therefore, they're, they're talking about but harm. kids can and consent. Harm. That they're just saying uh, are you, are animals you, harm wait, not, not wait, wait, sex. Uh, sex. Kids have okay. the concept of consent. I I don't understand like. Human beings, as people who enter into social contracts, work with the concept of consent. This is something we work with as human beings that create societies. Consent is a base to that. Animals don't have that within their social structures. Yeah. yeah just I, a, am I crazy? A, like, a, a, no, no, it's not crazy. So to advance the conversation a little bit. We moved on. Yeah, but yeah, we moved on from consent to harm. That was the issue. They were asking about bestiality. Do we have any measures but that then, bestiality yeah. causes harm to the animal specifically? Of course, but we also have we have lots of measures that show that eating meat causes harm to animals. Mm. So if yeah. if we're ruling out bestiality on the grounds of harm, then we rule out yes. mass manufacturing of yep. meat. Yep, yep, sure. yep. That's a vegan position. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah I'm a vegan. Also say <laughs> like, society on, agrees then, to some level the... of harm for any group and not other degrees of harm, right? Like it's yeah, possible but... that society says we're okay with the harm of mass slaughter, but not okay with the harm of bestiality. That that yeah, feels like wild. that's, uh, that's really, wild. Really, I would agree. Really, but if you're vegan, really, you can say concept. both are bad, right? Really, and that's really, like yeah, exactly. exactly. Uh, yeah. Really, you were trying to talk. So, like, why couldn't I say like me as a uh, Giga Chad meat eater uh, can fuck horses? No. You can. Okay, yeah, exactly. So, that's the point. Like, that, that's all I wanted to get to. I, I feel. Like I told you, I'm the bestiality person here, but, pushing okay. it. Go, but hold on, but hold on. Oh, but okay, okay. Oh, okay. But I but mean, this is if if you're a vegan, right? Th then you could be able to object to both like mass slaughter of animals yeah. and animal fucking on the basis of harm and consent, right? I believe so. Yeah, I think so I as mean, well. Consent, but no, okay. I'm a bit of uh, kind of on the sexual thing. We've got a problem. How to explain it? We've got a big problem because. Because um, I am very, uh, you know, I like to keep an eye on what the zoophiles are up to, okay? <laughs> and the consensus among zoophiles is that animals can consent to sex, and there's nonverbal cues that they give you to suggest that that's true. So what do we think about they that? They cannot, they cannot consent in the same degree that like a like a human being can. It's it's uh, well, no same degree. Well, yeah, exactly. No, was actually, yeah, but yeah, they're doing a little gesture like jerk wait, me off, but he's not <laughs> saying yeah, and someone does it. Is that rape? Like, well, okay. but they think it's it's like. Sex. There's almost no consent conceivable, right? Like, have you ever watched animals have sex? For oh, example, yeah. when a stallion mounts a mare, there's not a lot of yeah. consent. She's usually super <laughs> mad about it, and he has to bite her to stay on, right? So the idea that, like, animals are like, I love this and I love sex isn't really real. The difference is that, like, most zoophiles are, like, You're pretty intense about, like, more, like, passive I don't know. They get really weird of like, I do passive sex. So they'll put like peanut butter on their dick and then they'll like call that having sex with an animal and stuff like that. And so it's like, okay, well, it's the dog consenting. No, it likes peanut butter, right? I could put peanut butter on a piece of shit and the dog would probably eat the shit and the peanut butter because it's a fucking dog, right? Yeah, so I think, aside, I th I so yeah, I think and for yeah, so dog as, slander. As far as I understand, then, like, so your position is basically that, like, uh, consent is a good rule for humans, but when it comes to humans and, like, other things, then we need, we have, we have different reasons for, like, so, yeah. Or we need, yeah, okay. Exactly. So I actually, I obviously personally don't support bestiality outside of the memes that we're having on this panel, Whoa. but no, I, I don't support it. I don't use consent as the basis for my entire sexual ethic. And bestiality is a great 
case study to show its limitations. It's a, it's a situation where it's completely an opposite. Cannibalism shows where even if you consent, there are things that we do not allow people to consent to in our society. And necrophilia shows that the harm principle doesn't always work because who is being harmed when a dead body is being fucked? So these fringe cases are really good ways to demonstrate that sexual ethics has to expand beyond consent and that trying to base everything in consent will ultimately fail because it is just trying to put a triangle through a circle. Yeah, it can be like a, that fucking little saying is. It can be like a multi-part thing, right? But then like you could easily of say course. like, yeah, exactly. So but then uh, like, uh, so would you agree then that like a, a vegan would be the only person that could uh, consistently object to both <laughs> like animal, like animal killing and bestiality and like all these things? Would you say that or? Rosaris, can I yeah, I mean, well, I think vegans are based I, like, okay, but I don't I think you can have objections to things within sex without having to be a vegan. I'm like sorry, you cannot you like this reality. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, yeah, but not not like. But okay, but do you think it is it is possible uh, to form like a, a a moral argument that is consistent that would like for for a non-vegan that would make both uh, animal farming sorry that would permit animal farming but make bestiality immoral? Uh, not if you were trying to base it on consent. No. Okay, but if you're trying to base it on what harm no you okay. uh, if you were saying so based on this as as erudite said before if we are looking simply at the social contract and what we have decided as a society creates norms then yes you could create a social morality where you said we're willing to accept the harm of farming because uh we want to eat but we're not willing to accept the harm of bestiality because we think it's gross and, okay. and perverted and just for pleasure. So, so then, and, and so, oh, 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 so then would you say then that if let's say society moves in a, let, let's say everybody becomes like you, okay, society moves in a pro bestiality direction generally, you know, okay? So this general yes. argument no longer applies. Now people feel like they feel okay about bestiality and the same way they feel about like factory farming. Would you then say that it would be moral to engage in both of those behaviors? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, can you say that again? Yeah, Sorry. so so because so your argument right now, yeah, you, fucking animals. Yeah, so your argument right now, loves factory farming. Yeah, your argument right now for why like a, a non-vegan would be able to say that like uh, bestiality is immoral is because generally society we react really negatively towards that. We don't want that to be part of it, and therefore that's mm -hmm. part of like a moral thing because it's going to make people in society feel really shit about the way that shit's working. So essentially, what I'm saying then is, let's say we have a cultural shift where bestiality becomes like normalized, it becomes okay, it becomes kind of like factory farming. In that society, that argument wouldn't apply anymore. So in that case, you, you would agree then that there, you can't make an argument against bestiality, right? I mean, you can make lots of moral arguments, right? But I'm talking about the socially accepted ethics. So morals on a public level, no longer on a personal level. Uh -huh. So of course you can still make arguments about whatever you want on moral grounds. But once we're getting to what's accepted as ethics yeah. on a social level that we all agree about as a group, it gets more difficult. But I'm asking about you then. Well, would, would you be well, able to? Oh, well, I don't like bestiality. I don't like factory farming. If you're asking about my personal morals, I'm not moral. giving you those arguments. So Rose, are you trying to, I think Rose is trying to ask is, I think he's trying to say that the only reason the social contract kind of prohibits bestiality is just like an arbitrary social contract, like handshakes yeah. or like, ma like yeah. manners basically. Is yeah, that what and, saying, right? and, and the point is like, if that, if that arbitrary thing, like that general social opinion on bestiality changes, would you no longer be able to mount a moral argument against bestiality? That, that, that's essentially my question. Because if you're oh, vegan, you so would still be able to. Calm. And you can't exactly. use consent. And, and you oh, can't okay, use sorry. that one. Yeah. Sorry, so, it's taken me so long. Yeah, no worries. Um, Is this what dating's like in real life for you guys? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So because because a vegan would, would still be able to a vegan would still be able to object to that. Like. <laughs> because a vegan would still be able to object to that. Never mind. Wait, wait, what would you say? Really? I was I was just gonna say. Would you believe me if I told you I had a roommate who lost a relationship because he wanted to have an incest debate <laughs> oh my God. Check on the first date on the first date he wanted to well, they're DG oh, gear or no. yes they are <laughs> yes, i thought that are. you were meaning like a six month relationship well first date is a yeah choice. that's yeah oh that's, uh... okay right actually sorry i'm, I'm always looking the, for I'm, debates in the first i've just got I've just got a quick question, okay? I'll try and, you know, make it really short because it's quite a long thing, but I'll make it really short. So imagine you're dating someone for six months, you fall in love with them, they're an amazing person, all this stuff, right? And then you find out that, you know, uh, uh, like six months before you got together, they fucked a dog. Would you continue that relationship or would they just be smeared for life because of that? I wouldn't continue that relationship. Why did they fuck the dog? Because they were horny and they wanted to fuck a dog. 
No, nah, it'd probably be too weird for me. And like, it, it, in theory, I shouldn't care that much as long as they're cool or whatever. But like, it'd probably be in the back of my head too much. It'd be weird. It'd be I, weird. Yeah. 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 Trying to match up the Fido. Yeah. 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 yeah exactly. I, I can't compete with Doug Dick, man. I'll tap out. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> about this consent conversation, though, doesn't this in part depend on like where we get with neuroscience, right? For example, like there's a lot of people that like unironically try to argue that like, um, specific animals may actually have like some capacity of like what consent looks like. Um, and there's this really interesting thing when you get into comparative cog uh, cognitive neuroscience, where there's kind of this weird thing that we've done in most of neuroscience with animals, where we've kind of presumed that they're way dumber than we realized. Um, and then when we started testing them more accurately to, for example, like what they were evolved to do, um, their intelligence is really like divergent. And it seems like whenever we start testing animals in a new novel way, it pushes the bounds of like our understanding of their cognitive ability. Right. And so like, theoretically, like this is, this is another issue is like in the next, in the future social landscape where maybe bestiality is okay or not okay. What one factor that might come into this as well might be again, our neurocognitive understanding of animals, like maybe dogs can consent and maybe they can't consent. Right. Um, which at an academic level, I don't think is fully insane winning. to claim for some of the animals, like, like dolphins, chimps. Should um, we, should we try to, to recenter right. and get back on the, like humans at a very, well, I was just going to say, I think the, the final thing that you could say about this particular topic is that, um, there are some really important distinctions. Animals can obviously say like, yes, I want food. Yes. I want to go outside. Well, okay. In their own language, in their own way of it, communicating, expressing it, because we've seen dogs that use those buttons that then say a word, like they there are dogs. Communicate. That's not the yes. same as consenting. Okay. But there, there's an abstract idea of consent. And then there's like human consent, like legal consent, right? Like there, there's the consent that we're talking about that has like the, the very, human phenomena to it and then there's the abstract idea of consent that animals have that like yeah like animals can, can say like can they can consent on that level so like it's a a reduced level it's like a, a lower level right so you can look at the examples of um humans that are comparable um to animals in terms of just like whatever is going on in uh in the brain and we have lots of humans that aren't necessarily able to consent so you know, it's, uh, I feel like that's pretty much it is that you have like, yeah, like to some extent animals can consent, but they can't consent on the, the social, like human way. Yeah. I mean, this gets into like the, the tricky thing of like, how do we operationally define something, especially like say if we wanted to like test it, right? Like how do you operationally define consent? How do you operationally define empathy? Um, these are really like hard things to define in an operational way. Um, but theoretically you can do these things, right? Like we might decide that consent at an operational level is having some knowledge of what your decision will be and then how that decision will impact your experiences in the near future, right? Like some sort of like future thinking projection, which it's, it's very possible that some creatures might be able to do that. And it's also very possible that they might never be able to do that. Right. The issue is like, yeah when it comes to neurocognitive science, like we barely know human brains. We definitely don't know animal brains very well. Yeah, no, I think uh, and we're only really just being an understanding like memory. I'm not going to get too much, I, or spend too much time talking about this. Yeah. What's up, Joe? I think it's like, don't think of what consent can do for animals. Think of what animals can do for consent. I'm not really, when I'm bringing up animals, I'm not talking okay. about like, do can animals consent this is really interesting the harm we do to them is all based oh. on whether or not they consent that's not the question right. the question is is consent a good structure through yes. which to view all of our sexual ethics and when we look at animal fucking we see very clearly that there is an inapposite application of consent and therefore we see yeah. a limitation of consent which means that when we're talking about how we have sex we need consent plus we need consent mm -hmm. plus more because clearly there's an issue with bestiality that requires an extra layer of consideration beyond just does the thing I'm fucking or does the thing that is fucking me consent to the activity that's taking place as demonstrated by animal fucking. Yeah. So I sense? think, 
okay yeah that, that's really fair that's a good uh takeaway that we can add to the end of it is that um when we're talking about all these relationship and sex uh hypotheticals and situations that everybody finds themselves in um you don't want to rely exclusively uh on consent as some bible or like a holy code um there's more to human interactions on like the sexual and relationship level um but i'm also what? like uh, we're talking about like harms because i think that's where it came from like we can get, like rose said we can loop back a little bit to um like the, the chase of characteristics the harms of like uh different kinds of interactions but the harm thing was what really interested me because right now um globally we're seeing a lot of cases of monkeypox and there's a lot of media coverage that is trying to connect monkeypox to gay men and gay men having sex and it's kind of like the new almost like aids kind of thing and it seems like to me we're talking about like harm like what's the harm of like fucking somebody in the ass or like what's the harm of like fucking a dog or like what's the harm of um whatever else right and i think th this is like a, a very prevalent uh, like real world case like what um Wait, what, what exactly is the argument that they make um they're saying well monkey is gay. yeah monkeypox is gay basically what's that <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah it's a, a fact what do you mean, assumption that pop? all gay men are diseased and spreading disease. Yeah, well, well, that's exactly what's going to lead to. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I guess they've, they've... it's this tricky thing of anal sex that's unprotected is more likely to transmit specific types of diseases. Um, whereas, um, and we, we do see this. Your mic is also, cutting out a lot. Course, sorry, it's right. Oh, There's also, of course, this like stigma that gets attached of like, for example, like, I don't actually know the nascence of monkeypox specifically. Um, I know it's fluid transmitted, but I don't. I don't actually it's know like if post it's personal contact because it's not considered an STI, right? So, like this one's a weird one to connect monkeypox specifically to anything sexual because I don't think it's classified as an STI um, because most people are transmitting it through like saunas or like uh, drink cups. So um, the monkeypox is a weird one, but <clears throat> there is a question that we can have about like disease impact with certain like shitting in people's mouths maybe we'll outlaw it because it becomes a rampant issue where a whole bunch of people are now shitting in each other's mouths and now like e coli outbreaks are like yeah, yeah. running exactly. it, it, epidemics through the society and we need to like crack down on our e coli or something like it's like that, the right? difference between like the, the like the legal and, and moral things right i'm sure okay I, i'm sure everybody here has heard like destiny's incest argument right uh and, and that's an example of like yeah sure you can isolate a case where uh if you go purely by morals there is no reason to make the act of incest itself self necessarily legal there are other problems that we have with incest that that uh, that occur often in cases of incest i should say um but incest in itself doesn't necessarily have those negative consequences so why should we make incest illegal and the reason why we should still make it illegal is because um laws aren't perfect manifestations and reflections of our ethics laws are just rules and guidelines we set into place generally in society that is going to lead us to what we perceive to be ethical outcomes so it's not going to perfectly map on to like every single thing where everything we think is immoral is illegal and everything we think is moral is is legal but it's just like here are rules so if we make something that we don't necessarily think is immoral in itself illegal we can prevent a bunch of other immoral things from happening and therefore we still have the law in place and that's like kind of like the separation between um yeah between that between laws and morals in that sense so there, there is definitely a strong connection between them but they aren't perfect reflections okay uh i think at that point we can switch to the the secondary topic and then we're, that's gonna be a bit, bit shorter of a one and at the end depending on how like everybody's feeling how everybody's on time we might open it up to i might try something a little, little different a little spicy might see if uh i'm gonna maybe try to coordinate with some of chud's mods i haven't picked any of them yet i haven't even told any of them yet but maybe bring on uh people or two a schizo poster or two uh at the very end for like 10 15 minutes and see what shit yeah. Let's go. Do a shit show. So, but first, first, first things first, we're gonna do like the last like tail end of this uh, these questions. Uh, so it's been like sex and dating, right? Oops, sorry for hitting my mic. Um, and now we're gonna ask, um, when should you disclose like really uh, important, sensitive, personal details about your life to somebody that you just started dating? At the, so like Maybe what's an example specific? of this? Yeah. yeah. Sure. And uh, I'll restate it when Joe gets back. Um, so, like, if you have debt. Um, if uh you have like a criminal record i guess maybe or some kind of like sensitive personal detail that affects your life that may at some point affect them as well 
I think if you're setting up for like a, a long-term relationship, it's probably a good idea to just have like a discussion about this, those type of things generally early on, like finances, like potential, like, you know, criminal records and stuff like that, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, but if it's like a, if it's like a one night stand, I don't know if you need to do like a, like a credit check, you know, to, before you like get a hotel room with somebody. So, I mean, yeah, it's going to depend on so probably a better rule of thumb is when these unique, like kind of private details are going to become immediately pertinent and impactful to your partner, right? So if you're HIV positive, but you manage it through like medication, you need to tell your partner before you're having sex with them, like pretty obviously, right? Because your HIV positive status impacts them necessarily. And they need to know that before they like are able to consent to having sex with you, right? Um, your debt, you should probably inform them for sure before you move in with one another. And at any point, if you're gonna combine your finances, you also need to be notifying them, ideally before you move in together. Because once you move in together, if you last long enough, you become common law and, and then that gets into like legal dicey. So I would say in general, before these things are going to impact them, but close to when it's about to impact them, right? So, hey. Mm. So let's say let's say you're setting up for like a like a long term relationship, and one of you has like a like a really fuck like re like you have, you have really bad finances, right? And you're setting up for a long term relationship. Now let's say that um, like finances just doesn't come up. You guys like date for for two years, and you guys, no not dating. You guys are like together for like two years, uh, but you still live in separate places. And then like like two and a half years in, three years in, you guys are like okay, let's start moving together. And here like okay, by the way, here's like my entire dossier of like all the debts I have. Like now we got to figure this out. I think that that's probably something that you might want to talk about at the beginning if you're like if you're getting into like a long term relationship rather than like right before that's supposed to happen. Uh, at the beginning of a long term relationship seems weird to me, and also. If this is just like a hypothetical vacuum, I can just give it to you. But I don't think you would date somebody for two years straight and not have any idea about their financial status. That would be very, very strange to me. It would um, be unusual, but unless, let's say that that that, that wasn't. Yeah. So yeah. I said, if you want, mm -hmm. I want if you want to grant the hypothetical for the vacuum, mm -hmm. um, the question would then be, okay, well, how early? Right. I'm not saying the day before you move in. I'm saying, but like sometime before, if you're going to talk about moving in, most people are going to take like at least a month because you have to cancel your apartment or whatever you're staying at to move in. So like probably at when you talk about it, you should at least when you're talking about moving in, be like, hey, this is one thing that's coming up for me. And that might change whether, right? So that they have like time to process these things. I don't think you should do it like 10 minutes before, right? You don't want to be like, hey, now that I'm moving in, just so you know, like. <laughs> like well, well, we're on our way loans. to sign the contract on the mortgage, <laughs> by the way, here, like yeah, later exactly. this. Yeah. Thanks. Exactly. All right. Well, yeah. okay. Everyone's just going to be a pussy about this. I'm going to reveal my truth. I'm going to speak my truth. Okay. Yeah. There was one time I was dating a girl for like, a long time. And Fake I didn't tell her until about okay. six months. Sorry. Okay, yeah, that's true. Fuck. Anyway, I was dating this girl for quite a long time. Um, in the end, we dated for like over a year, but I didn't tell her till six months in that I had kids. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah. How do you feel about that decision, Chad? That's looking back. Well, at the end of the day, what the fuck does she need to know? Well, listen, in all seriousness. I wanted to tell her, but it gets to the point where it's like, you're not going to tell her on the first date, or the second date, or the third date, but then before you know it, you're six months in, you're like, fuck, I'm not Wait, how her. many and dates are you going to do? I think like date 67. Anyway, she found out oh, I was my. really annoyed with me, but still continued to see me. Um, Let's so, yeah. go! <laughs> that feels like probably Giga something chat. you should disclose a bit. A bit like earlier on. But how soon though? It's difficult, right? You, know, you don't want to do it date one. No, like, maybe like date, date like three or four uh, or something. I would say. Like I don't know. Like, like, like I, I had a first date, like a Tinder date once, and I ended up at her house. And like the first thing she said to me was, "I have a kid. Is that okay?" And I was like, "Yeah." Yeah, I think well, it's. I think it's. I think it's, I think it's good if you just the way. You know? I think. Yeah, I think was it's good. Was the kid at the it. house? Oh. No. No. Oh, okay. I was gonna say if the kid was at the house, then that makes sense. But I guess just in general, I don't know. But, no, but but it does carry. It does like tell you about what their life might look like, right? Like parental responsibilities. Maybe if like it's if they're not living with them like at all anymore, then uh, it might be like uh, finance related stuff. Maybe yeah, like going to see your kid would be one of the things that would be relevant. So I mean, even if you're not living with your kid, I think it would still be relevant to disclose it. Yeah. Well, I think it would be relevant, but I don't. I don't think it's relevant on the first day to do that, especially if it's just a hookup. Yeah, if it's just a hookup, then there's then it's, it's it seems really unnecessary. But if it's like if if you have an idea that this might like go somewhere, then probably a, as soon as you get the, the the implication that hey, this might go somewhere, then you probably should disclose it. Yeah, if you want disclose, a long term like relationship, what, probably like, like that you have kids. Or wait, it depends oh, on what we're okay. talking about. Yeah, if we're talking well, about kids. Okay, so. I just wanted to clarify: Are we still talking about kids specifically? Um. 
And I think everyone should have an autobiography on hand that's like 6,000 pages. And then they had that off yeah. as soon as they think anything's about to happen. Yeah, that's what I think. Right. This is this is the thing with yeah, all these dating game. things is they're super, super intuitive. You kind of feel it out because it's like True. it's this weird trade off of both. You want to respect your partner by being open, vulnerable, honest, and being clear about what like some of the flaws are or negatives are to dating you. But also, not everyone's just earned all of your intimate details, right? And so like it's this weird toss of both like social rapport and safety and comfort, but also respecting the partner enough to like divulge information that you might not otherwise want to divulge. Cause what we're talking about isn't like information being like, I don't know if you know this, but I have a 4.0 GPA and I make a hundred thousand a year, right? Like that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about distinctly like things I don't want to give you and you don't want to receive. Um, and so mm-hmm. I don't know if you can make like this hard stamped rule about this because it's going to really depend on different relationships, different contexts, what's going to be appropriate between an 18 and a 20 year old is also going to be very different between a 40 and a 42 year old, like kids coming up on date one between like an older couple, not even fucking weird at 18 yeah, though, true. that might be really strange. And a 20 year old might be like, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not willing to buy into a kid at 20. Right. And so like, which Are is you- why I feel so bad for autistic people because it's super intuitive and it's like not clear mm-hmm. when. Yeah, because you don't want to just means. dump all the information right off the bat because then you come off as you know at the end of those like medicine advertisement that you guys have in the US like the person that speaks really fast at the end like listing all the side effects it just feels like <laughs> like if you're if you're like on the first date and you give them like an entire like rundown like oh by the way you know I have six kids I am like 100k in depth you know I never graduated high school like if you like give all that shit they're gonna be like okay whoa you know if this is all the things you're willing to disclose to me right now then oh fuck I can't wait to like unpack what's you know what's left but yeah I mean it's good to tell a woman that you're in debt because sometimes they'll help you pay it off so, uh, you know, mention that early. Okay. That's, that's a good meme, dude. <laughs> that's so good. Um, yeah. yeah. So what about when it's a, like a positive too? Does that modify it? Like, do you think that it's, if it's talking about something like, oh, I get an inheritance or like, oh, like I'm this, like, uh, from my, like whatever family, um, is there something different about it being good versus bad or do they fall under the same kind of treatment of these situations? So, uh, I've actually been thinking about that quite a lot, like the positive things, how we treat like withholding positive information so much differently than like negative information, quote unquote. Like if I was fucking filthy rich, like I was a billionaire's son or something, and I withheld that from my partner for like a year, they probably would be like, like happy about it and cool or whatever. But like if the opposite happened, whatever. And it's, so it's like, it's not necessarily about the principle of withholding the information. It was also about withholding what type of information. Yeah. It, um, it, it kind of so... goes back to the, to the consent thing a little bit as well, right? How, like wh- what we define as good or bad information is kind of as deviations for what, like, like a normal, what you might expect from a partner. Yeah. Right. So if you have, if you have something that's like, if you have negative information, thus putting you on some metrics, like below what the norm or what the expectation might be, you probably should disclose that right off the bat so the person knows what they're getting themselves into. But if you had like specific things that are going to be like putting you above the norm or above the expectations, um, then I don't think you have the same obligation to disclose that in a, in a similar way. But, yeah. So here's a really good hypothetical. I don't know. Have you guys seen a 90 day fiance? I'm not sure if you've uh... <laughs> Is there seen a, a lot of, billion seasons of that? Yeah, like there's that. a fucking billion seasons. There's a newer one. Uh, my friend that wasn't able to be here, Blink, she was has been watching some on her stream. And um, well, there was one episode where a guy met a woman uh, from somewhere in Africa. And he's in America. And he's like a wealthy guy. And every time that they FaceTime, he's like directly back against the wall. Like the only the walls are directly behind him. You can't see anything about his living or lifestyle or whatever. But then he goes to visit her and he's blinged out. Like he's wearing nice clothes. Like he oh, shows I that like he, he's got money. And then when she, when it finally gets to, because this is one of those, uh, one of the new seasons where it's like mm-hmm. post uh, pandemic. So they've waited to see each other for like years. When he finally brings her over after like two years or something to meet her and like be like, hey, like, this is where you're gonna live like all that shit let her see his life and everything he brings her to his childhood home which is like some like run down beat up house and then his actual house is like this beautiful like modern like recently constructed like guys clearly got money so i feel like this is a really great example of like is Wait, so was he rich or was he not rich? He was yeah, rich. He, he was a real estate developer, yeah, or something but like that. But he was lying and pretending Ugh. like he was poor to... Yeah, to okay. test her. Okay, well, shit testing is just sh- shit. shit. Yeah. Testing. Test your partners. That's I mean, that's fuck. less about, like, when should you divulge things and just, like, why are you shit testing? Um, just yeah. in general, I think, sh- like, 
at this I point, it's not just like not this a lot. But like shit testing is just basically saying, I don't trust you and I don't even mm-hmm. trust you enough to just communicate my boundaries or concerns. So instead I'm going mm-hmm. to trick you. Like it's just so manipulative. It goes mm-hmm. beyond not disclosing. Right. And now you're like actively hiding. So then yeah, let's not... get interesting. Okay. Let's say okay, you're a celebrity. Do... All right. Let's say you're a celebrity and you know that almost certainly people are going to like you or wh- whatever, but you find somebody that doesn't know who you are. Should you have to disclose that you're a celebrity immediately? Or should you be able to live life for a little while as a normal person, quote unquote, and not like be like, oh, look, I'm, I'm so cool and, and I'm, I'm all that. Should you be able to live your life for a little bit? Or is that shit testing? Like? Kind of a big deal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Probably depends yeah. on the level of publicity that you have. Because if, if yeah. you're on date one and they don't know and then a fu- bunch of like fucking paparazzi shows up they probably yeah. need to know beforehand because that would be like probably not the funnest yeah. thing okay, um yeah true and so also if somehow you avoid what that publicity right? level are you kind of meaning here like are you able to well, let's say you're leonardo, Di- you're leonardo dicaprio but you uh don't go outside with them so paparazzi okay, okay. Issue. no but you should probably you, you should probably still actor. disclose it yeah you should probably still I like think let them so. i think so i, I don't think so Okay, the reason why I think why? so, the reason why I think so is because your life is going to be, so the, the whole thing about the, the thing I said before about the positive news on the barometers is that's assuming that that thing is pretty much objectively positive, right? However, yeah. if it is the case that like you're going to be with like a famous person, that is going to like drastically alter and modify like what type of things you guys can do. So mean, you won't be able to just like go out to the town and like hang out anymore. And if that's something that you really want to do with your partner, you should probably let them know that, that hey, that's not something you can do with me ever because Wait, I'm really but famous. But isn't that Wait, something absolutely. you discover in a relationship? Like you could date a doctor and it's like, I'm not, go- I'm going to be on call all the time. We won't be able to go on holidays you can date a phd candidate you should probably let them know that you should probably let them know but you learn that in the relationship like leonardo dicaprio can say i'm an actor and by the way you know like sometimes you know we'll have to do like publicity stuff because it's part of my job but like if you okay well that's that's that life and you're like i can't tolerate this life then that's something you find out when you're when you're in the relationship it's not something i think you need to disclose and be like I'm, I'm going to be honest, this is inevitably going to come up like uh, date one. What do you do for a yeah. living? It's Wait, like but hold on. The, the, the question, the question that was asked. Is, it, so if you lie, right, if you're like, oh, I'm a engineer and you're like Leonardo DiCaprio. Okay, well, lying's bad, obviously. Right. But like the idea, like I must disclose it. If they don't ask date one, I don't know why you would need to disclose it. Okay. Probably Let, by like two months in, you wait, should disclose okay. it. Let, but let's say it, if it's yeah. lying down, oh, wait, if it's lying down as yeah. opposed to lying up. Yeah, this is what I want to get to. Like, it, yeah, but if your job something is something that I've been personally struggling with is the problem that Rose Wrist is getting to is what counts. You need objectively positive um, things like just I am wealthy. That is it. Um, things that are like pretty universally positive to be disclosed otherwise like the famous thing well you could be like cold like a slut and whore for the rest of your life for leaving leonardo dicaprio and just because you didn't know he was leonardo dicaprio you could that could happen you and, could be put up on that list that leonardo dicaprio has of all of the what is it white, 25 year old blonde, women. 25, yeah, 25 <laughs> yeah. year old women you could be one of those faces up there and you could be known for that for the rest of your life and not know you were getting yourself into that and the point of the question was like let's say that, that somebody goes and date leonardo dicaprio and they don't know who he is and he's able to keep it like a secret for like a little bit you probably shouldn't yeah. do that you probably should like even if they don't ask let's say they're they're just they're just silly whatever it slips their mind they they don't ask about what this person does for a job or whatever at that point you should probably proactively disclose that because that's that's a massive alteration to what like a traditional relationship would look like you said something really interesting there which is like they're able to keep it a secret right i think if you're actively trying to deceive someone that's different to just like going with the flow being honest being like i'm an actor i mean like i work in like big movies like that's going to come up as erudite said pretty early on but if you're actively being like oh you know i've done some stuff here and there and like you're making it sound like you're just like some off off broadway community theater person versus like the biggest movie star of all time if you're actively saying stuff to mislead someone i think that's different than it's just like being a private matter let's get a little bit more spicy then because you like in that in that realm you've kind of fucked over a lot of famous people there's a constant saying that a lot of famous and rich people say you can never make new friends and that then they're just they're kind of fucked in in that yeah, realm no true. so then yeah, like are, are they fucked then they can't i can't like try and go up to a 
a woman if I'm a multimillionaire like accountant for fucking Wells Fargo and I can't just go, oh, I'm just an accountant. Well, they mostly date that. within their class. That's where most can. people date within yeah. their like, well, social sure, but I'm class. Well, Wells Fargo isn't a good don't. example because it's, it's like, not like a celebrity yeah, thing. Like, That's just like a well, wealth like, this thing. This is right? where celebrities date celebrities. Okay, this so then, yeah, let's see. can focus on each other. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's not the only, not the only uh-huh. reason as well, though, because like if you're a big celebrity, then like the the only kind of people who are going to be able to empathize with your yeah. unique situation in life in general is going to be other celebrities. It's not just the income, and there's not going to be the weird power dynamic with money necessarily. Oh, here right? we go. Or, That's like, an excellent then, transition to the to the next topic. Right? right, because if you've got like a superpower celebrity who's dating like literally like a random fuck with like a high school diploma, that gets into this really weird territory of like, well, Leonardo DiCaprio probably has an incredible mansion, and I have like a $900 apartment, right? And so, like, this is now getting into whole other dynamics, which is why this idea of, like, well, like, if you're dating Leonardo DiCaprio and it's two months in and you still don't know, I'm like, I literally don't know of a world where you wouldn't have some idea of something going on based on his phone. He'd be getting tweets, buzzes all the time. His house is immaculate and huge, right? Like, unless he's actively trying to hide this from you, then... The the point of the hypothetical is, let's say you got, like, you, 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 you got like through like a week or whatever of the relationship and the other person still hasn't found out. You have an obligation to disclose it. Regardless of how the reasons behind why they haven't found out, you ought to disclose it. One week? Or like like I think I think like if if it's uh if it's anything if it's like a like a one night thing then I don't think it's really necessary. You've been honest but... about every question they've asked. So you haven't lied Yeah, about let's say the person just they, they, they just ask really they, they just they, they just aren't asking the right questions somehow. Uh, I think you should I disclose it. Have an obligation. I think you absolutely do because I think that when you when you start up a relationship, you kind of both of you start with the expectation from the mean. You start with the expectation for this is what probably like a like a regular like an average relationship would look like, and then if there are significant deviations away from that average that are specifically in the, like in the negative realm or like subjectively negative realm, you ought to disclose that one hundred percent. I I think if we're like starting to treat other people like. I'm going to like borrow from destiny, retarded children, right? Like if somebody is literally like, like, so like something so off that they like can't figure out to like ask some like pretty basic questions that literally everyone asks this idea that now like the moral onus is on you to like protect them and guard them and make sure that they know all these things is really strange. And if that's something that matters to you, like this, this idea that it wouldn't, I get that you're saying like in this hypothetical, it doesn't come up, but I'm like, at that point, I still don't think it's morally on you. It might be best practice to disclose, but there's a big difference between best practice and intolerable. And I wouldn't say it's in, I would say it's tolerable to not necessarily disclose. I would, so I would, I, sorry, yeah, go on. I want to say it's pretty easy to be able to avoid telling somebody about like how famous you are. You could like in the actor example, you could just say I'm an actor and most people will assume that you're a failing actor because most actors are failing actors. Yeah. Like but if the assumption is also that you're at your home because you're avoiding the paparazzi, well, not most actors don't have multi-million dollar homes. Okay. So now like where else you're going to go? Let's assume that you're not well, at no, home. You don't have to. A lot of actors have multiple houses. Like Johnny Depp owns a completely normal looking house. Okay. Just take him. You could take him to that house. Or you could just not he, be like, at people's he, houses. You could just like, like yeah. the, the, the actor guy or could go like. go over to their place. Yeah. And they just, they're all wearing Target clothes and stuff like that. Like, I don't know. The yeah, idea, that's like, a lot of common amongst people do that. Yeah. And billionaires, mm-hmm. at least like the real wealthy people. Yeah. They wear Walmart. They wear fucking right. and then and then we move into like other things like for example your scheduling um the amount of times your phone is just getting called constantly and texted it, they're like, on a date they turn you, off their phone like when they're dating they they find a place in the schedule to go on that date and like it's it doesn't do you have guys to be, not you see though that now you're like getting into the place where people are actively deceiving if you're just being yeah. upfront and you're just being yourself like you don't you're not trying to like get around things there are hundreds of professions or things about people that you can learn in the process of dating where you're like you know what your lifestyle doesn't super vibe with me you work like 15 hours out of 24 hours and i want someone who's more laid back or you are super in the public eye and i want someone even even failing actors there are people who are like your job is too intimate i don't like watching you kiss people on stage i don't like you simulating sex like i just can't be around that there are all sorts of things you can learn about people's occupations and lifestyles that can make you not want to date them i don't think you need yeah. to disclose but, but everything the, the that point, might trigger someone on dating oh, man. that's the real thing okay some girl fucking themselves with a dragon dildo every saturday and they got up you got to put up with that is that okay or not like what's the deal there if i say to a girl yeah sure but like somebody would say that's anti-sex work but like i don't want to be with a girl who's showing her asshole to about fucking five thousand people do you know what i mean 
You're allowed to have your but how shitty are you going to be? People are allowed be? to feel yeah. like you're being shitty about it as well. Like, of course, you're allowed to have that preference. And then if you're super condescending and rude about it all the time, people also might be like, "Hey, you're being condescending and rude about this thing. Just don't date them, right?" Yeah, like if you say it that way, you'll obviously have problems, right? But, but yeah, Chad, we're Tom policing you right now, Chad. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, you, really the you get to say what you like you get to have True. the preferences you like but you are still accountable for how people react and feel to that right like this is the like the most annoying thing is when people are like why can't i just like say obtuse like rude things and i'm like you can but then you can't that doesn't mean that you're suddenly like now protected from people responding to that and being irritated right like yeah, sure. If you ask I guess someone on a date one, Chad, what do you do for money? And they say OnlyFans, then this isn't an issue. If they hide the fact they do OnlyFans and they deliberately don't tell you about it, then that might be an issue. It has nothing to do with the actual occupation. It has everything to do whether with whether someone is actively hiding what they do for money. I will be right back, but I think I'm going to give you a, a slight meme as I leave. I just have to. I left my food Great. downstairs apparently. Um, Speaking of Leonardo DiCaprio and this age gap thing, I think everybody, oh, I'm guessing everybody saw the meme on social media where it's like, um, it's like, no, don't turn 26. Ah, you're so hot. Because yeah. Leo only dates like. Oh, yeah. Like, well, what, what is this thing, women? right? Well, Leonardo DiCaprio gets in trouble for dating people that are of a legal age and are legally considered adults, not, not by any small margin either, like in the mid 20s. And because Leonardo DiCaprio is dating those people, like, does that not take all the agency away from the woman? I, I don't get it. What's well, that he leaves them when they get like when they pass a certain age? Isn't that what he does? Yeah, people just think it's yeah. like I think it's not like the cover isn't getting in like legal trouble. People just think it's kind of weird. <laughs> that's that's like what it is. No, sure, but I just you know it just feels a bit weird to me that you know. Um, uh, so what he leaves them when they reach a certain age? Is that yeah, true? Like twenty five. No, he yeah. leaves when they turn twenty five or twenty six. Yeah, like that's <laughs> resets the clock. Over that yeah, yeah, exactly. And then and then it goes back like yeah. five. Yeah, exactly. It, it is kind of weird right but again i don't know this goes back I mean, to like you get to have your preferences but also people get to feel some sort of way about your preferences exactly. it's kind of fucking weird. <laughs> does he have like the birth certificate like is he vetting like i don't know no Very yeah apparently it's like it's, yeah but i think he'll, he'll re refuse the day anyone is over 25 yeah it's like yeah let me yeah. see if i can find the, the image uh and as he gets older it's going to get increasingly weird right like that's just, it, especially is, if he like maintains his behavior for 10 years or is this like deliberate how, how do we know it's deliberate I think it's is it funny. just a, is it just reasonable? <laughs> he just like it's it, it, there's been like there's it's like 25. six seven eight, no there's even more one two three four five six seven like eight partners. Uh, um, this is Evan too. Hold on, let me see if I can find the graph. It, Does deliberateness it. change the weirdness though? Like even if it's just like he just like happens to just be like ah oh, I'm really over this girl at like consistently the same age and then always finds a part that's younger and there's no intentions behind it. I, have a I think chart. we'd still be like there's something weird going on here. I'm gonna post a chart in the chat. It's really funny. No, I have it as well. Fuck you. Got before me. God damn it. It's the uh, it's the dates and confuse me, and it's the whole fucking. Oh yeah, exactly. I get older, they stay the same age. Yes, they do. Yeah, it's like you just see, it's like there's like a graph here. It's just like you see the line of his age going up like that, and then all the women just like hovering at the This bottom. is paras unironic parasocial shit. Okay, not not you on the panel. So the person that made this, you are taking that much interest in someone's <laughs> dating patterns? That is fucking schizo shit. True. You know what, so you know what true. That is? That's a that's a 26 year old white woman that made this. The, the <laughs> oh. white it is for sure a basement neat who made that. That is way that is way too organized. Wait, I think wasn't it like Forbes or yeah, some shit that made this? I think it was like a like a like because a, a BuzzFeed journalist was a BuzzFeed journalist. Yeah, okay, okay. guy, a male BuzzFeed well, journalist. BuzzFeed journalist, male guy living alone in his basement as a neat. Hmm. There are different. Yeah, so it was like it was up to to twenty three then. 20, no, okay, never mind. There was two different ones. So yeah, the first one he dated, and then they turned 23, and then they stopped dating. Second one, 25, they stopped dating. Third one, 23, they stopped dating. Uh, next one, 22, they stopped dating. Next one, 21, they stopped dating. Next one, 25, they How stopped dating. Next one, 25, they stopped dating. Next one, 21, they stopped dating. How fast? I mean, he hasn't like he hasn't so. dated a teenager since he was 25. Pretty he's fast. Only 20 up, so. like a year Good on him. Around. What a guy. <laughs> he keeps it about 12. That's all it is. I I yeah, was it's gonna say, because maybe these are just I think this is funny. that he's gone uh, Yeah, who knows? It's almost exclusively a year turnaround. I don't think <laughs> we were analyzing. I don't think I see any gap. Like when you're looking at the ages of these different women. Oh, no, no, no. Wait, 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 wait. Because uh, Giselle Some of them was were them 99 old. to 04. Okay, I was just meeting, reading the graph. Bar yeah. was 05 to 010. Okay. 
All right. Um, as much as I, w well, I'm going to leave it up to you guys. Um, we can keep talking about this stuff and like the very final like parts of the questions. Um, but there is a apparently famous schizo poster from Chud's chat that wants to jump in. And uh, I'm not sure who he wants to talk to or if it's a specific person or like what he's going to say or how it's going to go. But I thought we'd chuck him in here and Does see his how name goes. rhyme with Marmol? No, it's uh, J.P. Morseman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we already got some laughs out of there. Okay. All right. Uh, I want to address the elephant in the room because you guys were talking Game about like, fucking celebrities and shit. Well, like, what if your job's a niche internet micro celebrity? True. How do you. Well, I mean, you know, it's not like I'm not that famous. I'm not that famous at all. But like, it, you know, it is that big of a deal. <laughs> exactly. But the, the thing is, is like, I mean, I just find it just the fundamental issue of talking about it really frustrating because people want to know, like, you know, um, oh, what's your name online? I want to look you up. Yeah. And then you're on a panel talking about bestiality. And it's just like, <laughs> oh, no, thank you. I, I try and keep business and pleasure very separate as much as possible in that respect. In fact, I just don't like date people. It's easier. Like a lot of people don't know what a YouTuber or like a streamer is. You you could say I'm a YouTuber and they're like, they're either imagining like fucking um, like some 2 million sub cooking channel or just some like loser who screams about trans women to like 50, 50 viewers. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you have to do a lot of elaborating once you get started. When I once got recognized on a first date by a fucking Nazi who had raided my Discord <gasps> like a week earlier. So, Wait, like uh, were yeah. they the person you were going on a date with or was that just some, <laughs> some other? Well, that was, uh, yeah, no. Okay. I was on a date, and then the guy, like, uh, the guy just, like, saw me oh. from his window. Oh. We, were sitting, we were sitting on a bench waiting for, like, a shop to make our sandwiches, and then, like, yeah, he just came down and said, are you Loner Box? We raided your server, like, last week, and some shit went down, yeah. Oh my God. He was really timid, like, Jesus. in person, but, you know. Yeah, but that's you how know, it is. That's been my experience. They always I've met. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's been my experience. I've met a dozen or so people over the years, over the last, like, 20 years from the internet. Nine times out of ten, I think I've only ever met one that really carried the same energy that he had online. Yeah. Everybody else is just different, uh, more timid, more meek, more in person. Usually, when I've told people about like like my like streaming and YouTube thing, they they they're like, oh yeah, you know what's your channel, whatever. Send the channel, and then they they uh, they watch a few videos, and they're like. Well, I'm surprised that there's an audience for this niche of a topic and this niche of a, like a style of content. I'm like, okay, what's the implication? You know, but yeah, that's that's the that, those are the type of comments I get really. But yeah, I I, I had kind of the opposite reaction with uh, my girlfriend where I told her and she experienced my stream and she never watched streams and stuff before, and now it's literally all she does. Is watch oh stream. no, you made all somebody terminally online, yeah. around. What the fuck? Yes, yeah. Who does she watch? I don't know. Though? She watch guess. I want you to guess who she watches the most. XQC, just because he's so huge. Hassan. I'll give you a hint. They don't stream on Twitch anymore. Oh, Destiny. Yeah. Nope. Oh. Uh, Oz. What's that guy. Nope. Starts with Mr. Mr. Girl. Mr. Girl. Mr. Girl. Mr. Girl. Mr. Girl. No. Oh, oh, right. oh, Every oh. fucking time I'm done with my stream, it's like I just hear this man's voice echoing through the halls of my house. <laughs> <laughs> oh, did, you, did you ask her how she felt it. about me and Mr. Girl's fight last night? And she she she's she talks my ear off all the time about all this stuff. <laughs> I don't want to say anything because apparently some people in her IRL life watch uh, some of the stuff that I do. So I don't want to say anything about ah, her political. Fair, 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 fair. Whatever. But, uh, um, I don't know, erudite, if you've had a similar experience, but not so much with like intimate relationships, but even friendships and family. The second I talk about doing anything online, it's like a, an immediate suspicion that I'm a cam girl. Like there's no concept <laughs> that you can stream online and like not, it's just like the immediate, if you're a girl and you say you stream, it's like, oh, like, what do you stream? It's like the immediate assumption that it's something sexual. Didn't Pokemon so, talk about that for a while too? Did she? she had a, I, I, I think she did. She talked about how much trouble she had with like, or was that, I don't know. It might've been something else. I It, it was either dealing with the the idea that a bunch of people expect her to do sexual shit or yeah whenever she talks to um to for, people about what she does for they me they just assume it. i play fortnite they... and that's all <laughs> yeah it's, <laughs> I, it's really weird there's a lot of common like women's experiences that i just like almost never get to experience like i never get that assumption about me i don't know if that's because of like training like or because like I've been doing a lot of public speaking before I've gone online. So like maybe there's just like that transference. Um, but 
I almost never get that assumption, but I also like, I seem to be like distinctly under-sexualized by a lot of people and I'm not really sure why, um, but I, yeah. a lot of women, when they talk about like even being online, like how much sexual harassment they get, I literally have gotten like, like everything I get, I post online because it's funny to me, but like four comments that were like really egregious and inappropriate. Like I, I really, I just I don't- I get more comments. I've done four comments. I get more than four comments about like weird sexual harassment yeah, stuff. I don't know stuff, why. So, yeah, I don't I'm know. not sure if I just give off like extreme like prude vibes or just like I'm too like motherly. No, I have no, no idea, no. but- who knows yeah, why? I, I just, just yeah, I was just wondering. If I don't know was, if giving up a motherly vibe would give you less comments. But... <laughs> you know what yeah, is going to be one thing. One thing I've noticed <laughs> sounds like a main problem. <laughs> yeah. What one thing I've noticed with a lot of female streamers is this this tendency where like if you did the the exact same the male equivalent, it would be really weird. But you know, I see a lot of uh, male chatters in i don't even really know. I assume they're male chatters in these female creator spaces where they're like, "Mommy." Like, oh my god, is mommy streaming? You know, they like call the female creator mommy. It's like, what? Why? Yeah, I was about to say, I don't know if giving up a motherly vibe would give you less comments like that. I, that's... Yeah. Yeah. I just, I, it's, mommy. It, yeah, it, it baffles me. I, I, I mean, it, okay, on level, okay, on level, I obviously understand the mommy thing, but at the same time, it's just one of those things where it still just, like, shocks me, right? Like, there's this almost, like, platonic, like, yeah, anyway. It was, uh, I have empathy uh, uh, with all the female friends that I have, female content creator friends that I have. I have a lot of empathy for the experiences that they go through. Not um, in the art, I can already see like Chud rolling his eyes through his VTuber avatar, but I don't care. Like I have a lot of empathy for the shit that women go through on these platforms. Wait, what, what no makes you think I have empathy? No yeah, obviously. <laughs> no, obviously, yeah. Male feminist, sexual predator. I don't know where this memes come from. I fucking hate women. Like, yeah, I have a lot of empathy <laughs> and sympathy. What do you mean? I wonder why. For the female experience, I really do. All that annoys me is when you try to speak about the man's experience. People try female to and man. And go, it's what about, no, what about being a woman? No, and it's like, yeah, I know it sucks in some cases. It sucks with being not, a man too, though. Let me talk to you about it. You know, that's what I'm saying. It's not because you talk about the man's experience. It's because your version of, oh, I'm not comfortable dating cam girls is, oh, you fucking what? You put a fucking deal down and you, you fucking want me to die. Oh, fuck yeah, shit. That's why. Maybe the other yeah, but dating cam girl is one thing, okay? Who's like just in a bikini or whatever. But if you got someone riding a dragon dildo, that's a different kind of standard, you know. And then there's people that you know fuck other people and shit, and that's a, a different standard again. So you, right, you are okay with dating some cam girls, but when they get to Wait. dragon dildo stage, then that's that's the yeah, line your line is dragon dildos. Well, I don't know, like, you know, there's probably a line. If there Where's your line, line Chad? Like, wait, 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 what, if there was some... what if it's an alien dildo, though? Is that okay? Or with the egg positor thing that, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> maybe that might be a bit weird for me. But no, the point is, is like, you know, maybe. it's not like I'm saying, oh, if you do any sort of, like, OnlyFans or whatever, I wouldn't ever consider dating you. It's just that, you know, there's probably a line that I'd be like, oh, I'm a bit uncomfortable with that, you know, and that's, I think that's okay. Well, Isn't it? Like, I don't no, know. It's like, fine. No, it's fine. No, it's. I think it's, 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 it's perfectly fine. fine. Or, uh, is that but the, the thing is, is I, like you know, obviously you're on a panel and you know, blowing it up a bit. But generally speaking, yeah, you wouldn't make a big deal out of it. It would just be like, this is the kind of person I would date. And if there's someone there that is doesn't meet the criteria, you just kind of say no and move on, and that's it. You know. Well, yeah, apparently but... I've uh, upset the schizo poster because we didn't add him in fast enough. I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm gonna chuck him in and see if he'll uh, actually pick up and answer the call. Um, let's see how this What's goes. What's the uh, difference between specific. a dragon dildo and a regular old dildo? They seem like kind of yeah, similar Yeah, I actually girth. don't know and I'm interested. Dragon dildo, is, dragon dildo is getting closer to bestiality, let's be real. Oh. In oh. terms of what metrics? Ontologically. Well, you, you know, it's not just a normal dick, is it? It's shaped like a dragon's dick. <laughs> okay, thank you for clarifying. <laughs> oh, no moderator <laughs> anymore, I guess. Oh no. That's wild yeah, out. <laughs> Oh, there we go. Oh, that was the wrong button. Actually, yes. If there's something that uh, we didn't get to talk about that you really, really want to talk about still, or a question you want to ask somebody, try to like jot it down, or whatever, and like hit me sometime before the next hour ends, before we end, uh -huh. and we'll get to it. Okay. So well, again, as in uh, serious. So what are your what are your arguments against the BCLD right now? Oh wait, me? Yes. Uh, I haven't really thought it through. I just think um, I, I don't have, like, I don't have a personal issue with someone in their personal life doing whatever the fuck. I don't have a personal issue. But if 
I think it's probably a good thing that at an ethical level, at a so social level, we have rules against bestiality. Or the reason and that it's, sorry, yeah. It's just, it's not based on consent. It's not based on, uh, on um, harm. I just think it's weird. Okay. So <laughs> I'm being honest, like, yeah, no, that's and I fine. think I if people it. were honest about why there are laws about bestiality, that's what it would come down to. Cause I mean, definitely that, not consent, uh, definitely not harm. That's how it is for me. I, I eat meat all the fucking time and you know, that's where I'm at, but I also don't want people to fuck animals. It's a purely feelings argument. Yeah. And I guess that's that, that's like that's fine because you can make the argument technically that you would say like from your utilitarian calculus that the like utility loss in society by animal fucking being okay is going to make most of society feel shit and feel bad and that negative emotions from that is going to outweigh the positive experience by whoever's fucking these animals and that's a fine argument to make but the only issue with that argument then is then you would have to say like hey in an argument where most people were like okay with bestiality you wouldn't have like a like a broad ethical argument against it. But I mean to be honest I've never actually had an argument about animals capacity to consent i literally only use bestiality to demonstrate the weakness of consent when it comes to sexual ethics as an overarching principle and the fact that more needs to be done to bolster sexual ethics beyond consent because there are situations where it is inapposite it is insufficient there are lots of of things where consent is not enough to cover the situations we're looking at so to be honest i don't really care about like bestiality in any meaningful way other than what i can use it for in terms of complicating consent oh okay yeah but wouldn't you I say that your argument is less against like consent being an overarching thing and more like uh consent being an exclusive metric and that's how that's kind of like yeah yeah, yeah i okay. think you need consent right mm -hmm. consent is the bare minimum but consent in in and of itself cannot be contained cannot be stretched cannot be forced to cover every single sexual experience that we see in, in, in human sexuality. Okay. Have you guys, um, there's a really interesting theory that's starting to look at how there may be an actual like genetic or like epigenetic phenomenon that's causing certain sexual revulsions that would be like distinctly harmful for like, um, basically species specification. So, um, there's, there's some evidence, um, I listened to a biologist giving a Ted talk about this, but, um, there's some evidence that incest may be somewhat like the disgust and revulsion we feel for it specifically, maybe somewhat like genetically inborn because it's like best for our survivability as a species at an evolutionary standpoint to not like incest, right? Because incest is actually like, especially from an animalistic standpoint, a really good solution of just like finding a mate simply just like, you know, mm -hmm. Fuck your sister, right? She's there. But if we have like this inherent genetic revulsion to it, it'll actually like prevent like all of the weird shit that we know happens when you fuck your sister. And then you create like, we've all seen the picture probably of like the king of Spain who is like the most inbred motherfucker in the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's also evidence that potentially like this species, out, out of species breeding, for example, like horses and donkeys don't really breed that naturally in the wild. You typically have to kind of force it in like a, human environment um because mules their offspring are completely sterile they're at an evolutionary standpoint they're a useless species um because ligers as well right <laughs> i think it's the same thing with ligers but yeah it's it's, ligers, it's there's a couple of crossbreeds uh -huh. like that that are t t typically crossbreeds are infertile because the gametes that they throw do not have matching types of chromosomes and what you said about the incest thing i, I can affirm because uh I, I currently had a class or very recently had a class about evolution of humankind and exactly what you talked about was taught there so it's at a level where it's being taught to like us at university right now so i would imagine that there is good evidence for it there. yeah it's just a really interesting way to look at incest from like a holy like let's not get moral let's not philosophize about it like is there just like evidence for where this actually comes from specifically mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i think right. epigenetics in general is just really really interesting like we can't discredit or discount the entire field as an entirety there's a lot of stuff that we can pick up like, like those things we can see uh things that are different areas or groups or families whatever are more susceptible towards so that we can deploy 